medical study on the effects of marijuana use confirms that everyone knows you're high and that you'll most likely never stop feeling like this. Your parents know you're high. Welcome to everyone knows your house. by Uncle Kale. You could have never come back. You know all that yeah. stupid shit. And Uncle Eric. If I could like retreat away. Yeah. Yeah. You should definitely try that. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Everyone Knows You're High, starring Uncle the Girl Guru. Oh, I got status. Fucking, I'm Uncle Eric, and this week we got Uncle Daniel and Uncle Brian from Mana'ai joining us in the studio. Hello, Welcome, gentlemen. Thanks and everything else. Thank you for joining us. Yes, sir. Okay. All right, so we are rolling. I'm going to light this up. I'm going to light it up because I want to do oh, something. Oh, shit, that's it. Okay, so here's the new fucking tradition. On the first joint, we light on the show while it's whatever. You have to say which something you're thankful for before you hit it. The first hit. You don't have to do every single hit, but mm-hmm, on mm-hmm. this first hit, you know what I mean? It doesn't have to be groundbreaking. It doesn't have to be fucking anything out of the fucking this world, but just one thing that you're thankful for. I like that. On this first one. And all the rest, we can just fucking be ungrateful for whatever we want later. Right. Just one thing. I like that. Is that right? cool? Yeah, that's fucking solid. So you guys too back there, because it, when it makes it around to you. Oh. Everybody. <laughs> Oops. Okay. So I got to think about what I'm thankful for. I am thankful for this space that is provided to us so that we can conduct these conversations with these interesting people, you know, on Definitely. a weekly basis, on a bi-weekly basis, whatever the fuck it is. I'm just grateful for the space and the opportunity to meet gentlemen such as yourself and be able to sounds cheesy but hold space to have these conversations but that is what we're doing so yes. i'm grateful for that so mahalo i'm lighting it you guys get time to think you can talk about i'm actually. ready already bro let's, let's go i was more worried about forgetting mine yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm gonna go before this guy fucking i'm never following this guy in any public speaking <laughs> that, that, he was all crazy. talking i'm like well how the fuck am i gonna say anything now <laughs> That's a great you just shot. leave the mic where he dropped it. Hey, Auntie Loretta did a good job. <laughs> she calls the show. Shout out, Auntie Loretta. Love you, Auntie Loretta. If you... Thanks for the Malawi. I am thankful for this opportunity to do what I love while helping other people. Yes. Mm-hmm. Nice one, nice one. I like this. We do this at my house. Um, at dinner time, when we have like a special milkshake or some kind of special <laughs> drink that we all share, so everybody got to say what they're grateful for before they take their first sip, and then my kids just overdo it, and every time they're like, "I'm thankful for this, I'm thankful for this." It's like once is good. It but definitely cool. makes it healthier. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Positivity as an ingredient in your food. I've heard of this thing called like mindful eating, where you like consider where your food came from, the hands that touched it, the 100%. work that went into it, not just like stuff your face and be ungrateful. You know what I mean? Right, so right. it's a little bit into that, but small steps. I got young kids. <laughs> right. You're making it easier for me to share my gratefulness without seeming uh, evidently shallow. <laughs> Sister, all I know is you born and raised Waimanalo, you went Sacred Hearts, but I just want to thank you for your yummy goodies that, that you made. And just the thought of providing a yummy goody for a kupuna, you know, to help a kupuna in their time of need with medicine in this fashion. Yeah, because all the kupunas, they really do want to sneak and have a little treat. But if that treat could be also simultaneously their medicine. Mm-hmm. So if you guys, no um, well, I, 
what is the name? Can we shout out your business or what? How do people? They're one of our sponsors, man. Shout them out. Solidify. Shout them out. Okay, guys, no joke. Buy small kind high. Um, what Sista is doing it tying into Homestead is what I'm grateful for. I'm grateful that there's a Hawaiian out there from Homestead land that's providing for other Hawaiians, specifically kupunas in the community. You should check her out. Ew. Major, mahalo. Yeah. Mahalo. Why is this cannabis is quite tasty. <laughs> I think there's a lot that we should be thankful for and we can be thankful for. A lot of times mm-hmm. we're just bombarded with other shit. We forget to like take time to like pause and be like, right. fuck, that's cool. <clears throat> Backpedaling throughout the day is a good thing. You know what I mean? Like sometimes like uh, I get caught up in the everyday hustle and bustle. Just slam the fucking brakes on and just kind of itemize your day. You know what I mean? Be happy with what you got, man. What are you thankful for? Mine's pretty easy. It's, uh, it's, it's why, why we do AO and, and what keeps us going. So just uh, I'm thankful for the opportunity to practice compassion and ease suffering through feeding people healthy food. There you go, man. There you go. Yes, sir. My dude. All right. Well, let's get this back to the production team so they can fucking. Guy on the couch got to smoke this, man. Oh, hey, guy. Guy. You might have to get up out of your chair, Kale. Oh, man. I know, I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> we need one of those gripper claw things where you can just fucking zoop. The, di- <clears throat> the dinosaur? Oh, shit. That would be cool. Or a flamingo. Oh, snap. What do you think? Oh, see this one? Mo- what are you thankful for? Did you say it? I did not. But <laughs> I am thankful for the abilities that I have to do what I do for those I love and the people around me. And for myself. And the few of brain cells I have right now that's <laughs> <laughs> helping me out over here on this production. What <laughs> right, are you, right, Mike? Right. Sorry, he's doing uh, he's in his edit mode right now. You gotta think about this one. These guys are hitting it before they say what they're thankful for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it shows you how much you guys listen to Eric. <laughs> Nobody so <laughs> while, there, while there's downtime, <laughs> what I wanted to do on this podcast was touch into what the projects you're doing, Uncle Daniel, what the up and coming projects, um, Aloha Organics, your philosophy on KNF, um, ability to translate that KNF into a comprehensible, um, you know, how people are so dialed in on the um, scientific side of things and how it's always defined. So. If we can bridge that gap for people at home, if you guys got any questions, if anybody, you know, even on YouTube tunes in, they got questions, it'll be answered without any, you know, because this modern day society, we tend to grow for production, not for care, you know, and I see that all around the corners. And, you know, there is a route for everybody, but like how Andrew was saying yesterday, um, Like how Andrew was saying yesterday, it's um, being mindful of the impact that you create, you know, while you're trying to do what you're doing. So, you know, there is growers out there that you won't pull them away from synthetics. They will be there forever. They're loyal to that shit. And there's guys coming in that are 60 years old and they're looking for general hydroponics. You know what I mean? Like they've been growing that shit forever. We're trying to right now get into those guys' heads that are so tuned up with, okay, um, I'm getting fucking, I need cow mag, I need this and this. How do we get those guys to transition to more of an organic water soluble alternative? Yeah. So I think that if we can bridge that gap, you will start getting that followers. And it's now our, that talk about being mindful of your, your impact on you know, your use, whether it be small. It's not a thing anymore because their impact now is nothing. It's positive now, right? Wouldn't you say the runoff of your nutrients is positive or detrimental to the land? I don't think you could consider it runoff. It's it's inoculating body. Right. That, you know, helps uh, break down probably toxins in the remaining environment, consumes them, or they're just consumed by other microbes that exist. It's not only, it, it not only doesn't hurt the land, but it it's beneficial. It Hell yeah. And that's the saying, right? If <coughs> help if you can, and if you can't help, at least don't make it worse. Don't or, fuck it yeah, up. Yeah, just <laughs> don't hurt it. You know, for me, I think about you know why people farm, and and oftentimes 
right? Why do we farm? One, we farm for food. Yeah. Um, in the general arena of cannabis, I often question, like, are you, are you growing this for your own self-consumption? Is this your primary medicine? And I think for those that look at it as a primary medicine that are trying to get away from, from Western medicine, this is, I mean, you smoke what your plants eat. Right. Right. And then how they're derived uh, and how they're impacted from the planet. It's very simple. The same time that Rockefeller was creating Western pharmaceutical medicine derived off of petroleum. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so was in the same time was the bloom of agrochemicals right. that were the other half of the petroleum waste, right? They found like they could make this thing that had short-term health impact on the human, and they could also make this thing that had short health impact to the plants. It's profitability, right? But over those years, it's been proven. I mean, you know, if you're trying to fight cancer and you're putting chemicals on your plants, I think your philosophy is misguided. Yeah, and I feel like for most people in the community, they never knew there was an option. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, my, my roots is not cannabis. Mm-hmm. My roots is subsistence food, catching fish, raising animals, eating what you grow. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't realize how spoiled I was. Mm-hmm. Um, going out into the food system, mm-hmm. it has been disappointing. Because there is a lot of food, but it's, there's no care that's put in the food. They're not growing the food as medicine. Right. Right? The, the way that they're growing the food, the land is getting sick. Mm-hmm. Right? If your food is coming from a place that the land is sick because of your food, come on now. There's a break in that chain. It's what is your food cycle. doing to you? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I don't want to say it's scary, but all of us do stuff every single day they're not in line with our values and our philosophy we feel like we have to yeah and a lot of that is just the norms that we've accumulated over these years i mean i drove here right. i didn't canoe walk run you know you go back a few hundred years ago i would be like i ran here from kahalu you know that, what's Kale, up, you're coming over my spot bro I'm not gonna yeah, <laughs> exactly no 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 my mouth flap would have been straight i would have been ah that would have caught me coming over the pool boom you know how you saw nine that? hours you turn your model oh sideways, goodness. bro, when you run. Turn them sideways. There you go. <laughs> Let me just tell you, I need to see a picture of the sideways model just to help me understand the flying Bruh, dynamics. I don't think that. they made pasties big enough for that, you know? It's like the same philosophy, like when you put your slippers on your hands to run faster, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Model sideways. You guys heard it first. Scientific turn your model sideways, fact. you guys are way more fast. Facts. <laughs> so, you know, I would, I would just, I don't want to say encourage, but... You know, in our philosophies, where can we start to change, right? right? Because all of us, it's the accumulated impact of everything that we do mm. that has tipped the cup over against our environment and our community, right? right? And the solution is as multitude as is the way that we got here. You know, mm-hmm. every piece of litter is actually a, an avenue for a solution, Right. You know, how we create and find that solution is each, uh, you know, it is up to us. But you got to think of it. Like, what is beach glass? Yeah, it was rubbish yeah. that some, you know, uncle was like, yeah, boy, suck him up. And then bust his bottle and then go in the ocean. And next thing you know, everybody collecting them. Right. right. In the form of sharp glass to cut your feet, that's a pain in the ass. Right. But when it's a beautiful shell now, because there's no shells, right, next mm-hmm. to beach glass, get one value. Right. So if we begin to identify in our system how our wastes are our values, right. right, how we can minimize or decrease imports, right. right, this is something that we are starting to feel, right, mm-hmm. and, and it's the impact of subsidies. Yes. Right now, the same dollar Hold that it. could have bought a dollar worth of biochar two years ago, today probably buys half of the same amount of char. Definitely, yeah. So the char guy, right, how did his costs go up? It was probably in the production of his char uh, and the fuel system that he uses, right? right? Because all of that is imported. Definitely. 
So the imported costs that are subsidized, mm -hmm. if we actually had to pay the real cost of food, right? I, I love to use your rice example, right? Yes. How come the expensive rice, well, the, the expensive rice is from Japan? Mm -hmm. It's expensive it because out. it was imported and it didn't have a subsidy, right? Right. In Japan, that rice is probably way cheaper because they subsidize it to their people. Right. Um, this idea of subsidy was introduced to Hawaii in 1959 with statehood. All 200 of the rice businesses went out in one year. 1960, 200 rice businesses gone. What did they replace it with? Imported cow rolls rice. Oh, there right, you go. poi consumption yeah. dropped by sixty percent because subsidized. We could not compete against subsidized food, and that was one of the benefits of becoming a state. Was our food was subsidized, yes. and of course came in Safeway, which was nice and shiny, <laughs> which was the birth of import waste. Right. right, prior to that, we didn't even have packaging for our everyday foods going in our landfill because our everyday foods was coming in bulk boxes directly from farms. Right. I mean, what you're talking about, everybody having to switch up all their habits, all their conveniences. I mean, people are going to be super resistant to that shit. I, you know what I'm I saying? I don't think there's, I don't think everybody, here's the reality, right? What was COVID? Did not everybody have to switch up their stuff pretty abruptly for the most part? This is true. Right. And the opportunity, the fear that everyone is mongering about the chance of this happening again is actually more than likely that there'll be some new pandemic that will have to shut it down and it will impact us. Monkeypox. Right. Monkeypox. Also, let's talk about this crazy thing that right now we should be embarrassed. Like we're smoking a joint while people in Ukraine are getting bombed on potentially. Right. Like I don't even know. The media is so crazy today. I don't, don't know necessarily know. what to believe what is <laughs> happening. But somehow <coughs> there's a conflict that is going on that has increased the cost of our everyday life. And if everything is based on petroleum in shipping and we are the most highest taxed import spot in the world right? right the jones act prevents china from dealing directly with us right so we pay to california and back on everything right i mean clear can we where where, where are is the like visual gains like at one point how do we stop the bleeding yeah self-sustainability that's a no fucking brainer but not only that it's like it's the idea that we as a community or as an island need to identify that, okay, that guy can't do the Ahupua system. You know, we need to adapt that on a whole island-wide basis. But the convenience and the way we were brought up, that's, I think that's what Eric's trying to say is like, it goes beyond a state of emergency. It's dealing with someone's behavior. Um, there's so many people that's conditioned to, I'm going to go down to the store grab them. You know what I mean? Rather than, hey, let's preemptively think about our grocery list for the fucking month and go check out a farmer and stock up. And I think the changes that happened and that people made during the pandemic were kind of forced on them. You know what I mean? Like the restrictions that were placed. This should be forced. On a lot of things that made people have to adapt. And luckily people are adaptable even when it goes against maybe their better interests in the long run. And... Yeah, it's just kind of... Just Who fucking. has control over gas prices? Isn't that being forced on us? Totally. <laughs> so, <laughs> you like, know what I'm saying? The, the force is, is, is coming from different avenues. What if that force came from inside of us and as, and as just our community and how we operate, right? This is... This is there was, I don't want to say there was a conflict, but I'm dealing with something in the agricultural world where, where people weren't necessarily seeing eye to eye in relationships to water. Yeah, and then... Unfortunately, I'm kind of getting old now, so now I'm more have to be responsible and like more like a silly kupuna situation where you got to like try to help people identify where, where the methodologies could be mediated. Yeah. Right. And so all I asked was, hey, can everybody check to make sure that where they're standing is coming from Pono? And can we make sure that our decisions are all coming from putting Halua first? 
Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if we do that, then on this particular issue, where there's not going to be any no issues, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, totally. Because if everybody's coming in with a different goal, then you're never going to be able to fucking see eye to eye. That's the number one flaw in all society is there's hidden agendas between every party, you know, and everyone goes their separate ways undercover and try to sabotage everybody else on the way up there. So and I like that you mentioned like the Ukraine thing affecting all these prices things but like you said who controls the prices of gas how do we know you know what i mean they could just be it could be an arbitrary number that they like to fuck with and as people we don't know and conflicts unfortunately are happening all over the world fuck yemen yeah. is still we still continue to drone bomb yemen it's yeah. fucking crazy uh, yeah. all these places and a lot of times it just depends on what resource that country has whether or not the u.s decides if they want to intervene or help yeah. or take out a government every once in a while so like oh, and these heavy things to the left I mean, the these things don't shit. it's Whoa. funny i just find it funny just how, smoke like, the joint make me all fucking depressed bro, about bombing kids in yemen and shit like there's always so, con there's always conflict in the middle east there always did you guys see been. though how much how much agriculture comes out of ukraine Fuck, did, and I how much know, people wheat. it feeds right and and how it connects to the food system i didn't I didn't know that until all this shit popped off and how it affected the baby formula shortage and shit. Right. But that, what that tells me is that we've always been on the edge of a fucking baby formula shortage. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Our if, ass was next to the chopping block you know on that I mean? one the whole if, time. You know? If one processing plant is fucking not able to do it, the whole system we run out, like, that's not a good place to be. Like, what the fuck? Yeah. That's scary. I wonder but, how but many you guys look, let's look at this. Too, you know I mean? yeah. This is the model of America. Mm. It's a conglomerate, mm. right? It gets made in mass. It gets sent out to Costco's and Walmart's, right? And that works when you can drive to the next Walmart. Right. Right. But we are living in a place where we have a subset of realities that is unique. Oh. Oh. Daniel will be right oh. back. He's off alive right now. <laughs> yep. You yep. check Not that. there. It's the vibration. Um, not um not everyone in the united states lives with our subset of criteria right right and covid to me was the universal like if you felt you were sustainable through covid i want to meet you yeah if you felt like what you were doing was in line to the needs of our community and you felt secure during covid and you felt good about every single day you are really the type of human being that I would be excited to connect with and learn about your strategies and philosophies. Interesting you say that because like during COVID, I spent a lot of time on my farm and I sat back and I was like, motherfucker, I need help. There's no way this farm would be by itself sustainable to feed me and my kid. No way. Like I would have to have an outsource of material where I could barter for shit that I didn't have. So look, Kalei, this is the roots of Aloha Organic, okay? The roots of Aloha Organic. I'm going to give you guys the full backstory right here, at least my involvement. Um, really start with a guy named Joe McGinn. Okay. And um, much aloha to brother Joe out there. He's out there doing education. Is that um, Bikini Base? Yep, Bikini Base. So Joe, I knew him through um, not farming. And when Joe started making comments about no smell pig pens and fish guts and stuff like that, I laughed. Right. I was probably kind of rude. Um, for Joe, I was like an um, excellent person to learn about how people were going to talk shit about your stupid no smell pig pen. <laughs> yeah. Because um, I grew up on, right next. I mean, I say I grew up on a 400 head piggery because... Where they killed the pigs every Saturday was 20 feet behind my bedroom window. The sump for where the pig pen was was 60 feet from my bedroom window. Smoke dookie all day. <laughs> oh, man. Actually, I'll tell you. No, well, we won't go down that line. Let me ask but, you a quick yes. fucking question. Okay. How many times have you had pink eye? Zero. Oh, that throws that Why, theory out the thing? fucking. I don't know. I just feces, <laughs> feces in the eye, right? I'm supposed oh. to get pink eye. Yeah. Rabbits. You know what? Like, crazy <laughs> enough, my, my Uncle Joel, he ran the most incredible pig operation as far as a commercial one. He had a sump, but he completely washed it down every single night. You oh, could sure. eat off the floor. His figs were very healthy. All um, Thank you, Bye, Sisna. Guys. You have a blessed you. night, you guys. Yeah, okay. um, boy. Anyway, um, he, was, he was 
Joe and Margie Pereira were were the most incredible subsistence farmers. I I think the they actually went to the store, and at the store, the store would give them all the slop, and then we'd go home and dig through the slop and make sure that everything that was still good was out of that slop. Was not in the slop. All the bread growing up, you know, this is like growing up country. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, all the silverware was all from a Chinese restaurant. Came out of the barrel. Um, wash them up. We good. It was good. Yep. Uh, except, you know, when you grow up in the in the crux, like so, like my grandpa is one doctor. Yeah, actually, both my grandpas is one doctor, and so I kind of grew up in like a little bit of a privileged way of white and I because kind of like when your grandpa is everybody's grandma's doctor then everybody know that and so they make sure you don't get in trouble yeah right, 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 and right, i somehow right. still managed to get in trouble being that kid but i could have probably got into way worse trouble but they was like no 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 yeah that's dr dodger's grandson right you. you had a whole west side watching you so so that really meant that growing up in Waianae, i was influenced by by these farmers and my grandpa, which means, you know, like, be like one smelly, stink kid. You know, if you, my laundry would be drying. My auntie would be cooking slop next door. The smoke would be going right to my laundry. My dad, yeah, buddy. he's like ahead of himself. He's so cutting edge. But during that time, cutting edge was, boy, your laundry's still clean. You know what I'm saying? It's only the smell, so I'd have to literally go to school. I remember Jacar Noir just like dousing myself and still smelling like slop. You know what I'm saying? Like it's in there, dried in there with. So I didn't want to do that to my kids, and so when Joe's telling me this stuff, it kind of got piqued my interest. Um, I made FAA for the first time. I was regularly dealing with Opelu guts when Joe and I had these conversations, and I started making the FAA. And I saw his piggery, and I was like, man, I want to do this. So in 2014, we moved to Kahalu. And from just making FAA, because I had fish guts every week, and being interested in the pigs, I was like, the first thing I want to do on my aina is pigs. And I want to put on the highest point of my land the pigs, because these microbes are really important in uh, feeding the soils. Mm. So I built a 16 by 16 pig pen in 2014. Killer. And we actually used the, the, the logs from clearing the land to fill the pig pen. And all the mulch came right. all from our own aina. And taking what we ended up finding out was a farm that for 70 years, for 50 years straight, had chemical agriculture and then sat dormant for 20. Mm. And that... 20 years of being left alone, the aina doesn't actually get better. Because nobody's yeah. doing There's anything. no it's microbes just, in the soil anymore. So it just grows. And right, you don't know how shitty. crazy it is? So this, when we got it, it had like a shade cloth right. over it. And all the trees had created a sub-atmosphere within it. And all the microbes were living on the vines and the root systems in there. You're like a fern hanging. gully going on in that bitch. Bruh, that's it. I promise. <sighs> and that's why when I went in there, I didn't just tear it all apart right off of the get go because I realized that Cody's microbes, they could be important. Right. Mm. Yeah. And right. they did figure out how to exist, not in the soils. But so what we did was started right. feeding them. Mm. Right. And we started incorporating the elements like logs. Later on, people said, oh, Daniel, that's Hugo culture. But this is what my Aina instructed me to do. Right. To fix it. It said, use the logs in this fashion. Right. It said, plant the plants that feed the aina. Yeah. Right. So we took those plants, the olena, that we grew on this aina that was sick, and we made fermented plant juice. Right. And we fed that to the aina. We took the dust scrapings from the pigs and added that every time we planted. We added more mulch. We started doing the bones. We had a class called Solution Saturdays. We just started making mm -hmm. these nutrients like... We want to learn about making nutrients and scaling up. Let's invite other people to participate. That's the first time I, I went over your crib was with Drake. Hold that, that little. That was the very first. That was one of the very first ones, right? right? And right. what happened was Drake came. Right. And he was like, freaking Daniel, you, you're doing this without the formal KNF education and you're doing them a little bit different. But, bro, your results are right on, on point. Right. So you didn't know what you were doing was KNF or like a like a variant of that. You just were 
I was lucky. And- I had Joel that I could talk about as far as solutions and so forth. Mm-hmm. But because I'd never attended one of his classes, I didn't get the full download. Right. Yeah, so I had to actually like fill in the blanks through observation mm-hmm. and Doing. intuition. Yeah. And then, you know, honestly, we just was working on <laughs> Um, if you guys check out Malama the Roots on Instagram, at Malama the Roots. So these Canucks, they came down, and they were staying in our Ohana unit, and they saw what we was doing on our Aina. And they had come for a few years, and they saw the Aina changing through all of this work that we're doing, but not even growing any food. We're just, like, building soils, right? Right. Raising these no-smell pigs. And he sees what's happening, and he's like, what, Daniel? How much would it be if I sent you a, a pallet? If you sent me a pallet of these nutrients. So the first year we ended up sending them two pallets. Then after that, it was a half container. And then it was a full container of, of straight, like literally I did the Jadam animal carcass with two year old soaking animals in coconut husk, water and leaf mold with multiple animal carcasses. So was sent to Ukiah. That's killer. Right. All of the beef bone, all of these things right now during this whole time, my friend here, Brian, he's getting certified by Dr. Cho in KNF and taking the official courses, right? Simultaneous to what I'm doing, he's developing a education and curriculum looking at natural farming directly from, like, learning from himself. the master. The master, yeah. Right? Um, he's on Maui, I'm on Oahu, to think that we would work together. Honestly, it was because of COVID on, on yeah. this particular project, yeah? We were talking about it, but it really wasn't a... Yeah, we talked about it for years, but that, that was what finally gave us enough time to sit there and, and just, just focus and get it done. So did you guys meet first during the COVID pandemic? You guys knew each other before that and just kind of started working together during the pandemic? Or I'm going to let Uncle, uh, Brian tell this story Uncle because of, of how we met. Before we do, I got a KNF question. Oh, okay. I, I want to lob out there to everybody listening. Yeah. Uh, KNF versus Jadam. There's What's no verses. Oh, it's no, yin and yang. Right. It's yin and yang. And when you see the lens of these microbes in the aerobic and anaerobic state, mm-hmm. yeah, you see them living mm-hmm. together. Mm-hmm. Then you can identify how to create resources on your farm mm-hmm. for that coexistence. Gotcha. Yeah, it's basically like sour poi and fresh poi together create a flavor. That is neither sour or fresh. You know, Got you. Umami. Yeah. yeah. If I can also add something that I, I think one of the easy ways to compare KNF as well incorporates a lot more. Can you uh, come up or, on the mic a little bit? Yeah. You can yep. bring it closer to you. Too, okay. You, yep. Sorry. No, no, no. No apology necessary at all. Uh, KNF incorporates more aerobic, whereas I think Jadam is more anaerobic. Mm. Most of the Jadam solutions are, are, are in liquid, right? They're water-based. So while there's gonna, there is oxygen in the water, for a certain amount of time, they're, they're going to be mostly an anaerobic, right? A, an oxygenless kind of process, right? So they're going to develop a different dominant set of microorganisms. Whereas I think the, the KNF is more aerobic at its beginnings, oh. right? You're, you're the IMO four is you're, you're spraying the IMO three onto the wheat gotcha. hole or, wh- or whatever you're using. So if you make a JMS and you aerate the JMS, um, do you essentially turn it aerobic at that point? I, 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 Why would you aerate it? Because if you want a fungal dominance, you kind of want it to be aerobic and not anaerobic. Yeah. The way that the, the JMS works is they're, they're the ones that, that build the system for those other microbes. So there's no microbe trans, uh, transitioning into what you're tra- – so you're not inoculating with JMS? No? No. You're building pathways for the next set. I mean, if you look at how roots are, are created, it looks fuzzy. Mm-hmm. Right? It's, it's a fungus. Right. The way that it happens is, is kind of like airborne. If, it, if the right nutrients are there, it is created. So what happens with these microbes is that through the water, they penetrate soil. They basically till. These are the, the pre-tilling microbes. Yeah. So every application that you add the JMS, it goes down deeper. So JMS can't be used in any aerobic settings. Well, let, let me just, I want, I want to add a piece. I think the reason why, what you're both saying, why you wouldn't want to aerate it 
is because it already ha- there is oxygen in the water, right? Just like fish will live in the water for a while. Yes. It, right. So there, if you use it within the three days that it usually takes to produce it, yes, where it's at its maximum microorganism density and diversity, it is fungal dominant already. There's no reason to go through extra labor. Ah. The point is to reduce the labor, use it at its, at its maximum. Yeah. So. So just a steep is good enough. Yeah. So once it's gotcha. full, like use it, right? If you're not going to do something with it, just dump it over. You're better at dumping gotcha. it over than you are aerating it and feeding it more. No, no, and don't. Just, just so like, I'm just one. like uh, yeah. trying to transition to like say the conventional farmer, or conventional ganja farmer, uh, would make a, a microbial tea, right? Yeah. So instead of using a store bought product like the Mycos WP or any kind of Mycos that you would buy in a powder packet, using the JMS to supplement your fungal indigenously would actually be a, a safer alternative. It, it, it would. It, but if you aerate, like, you know, people aerate their teas, right? And they do yeah. that just yeah. to agitate and to aerate wow. and to uh, multiply yes. the microbials. Um, could you do that with a JMS setting? I don't want to say it's it's redundant. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. Uh, KNF is about storing microbes and mm-hmm. applying them anytime you want. Gotcha. Right. You can feed the plant through the leaves. You can root drench. Mm-hmm. KNF gives you the opportunity to to be very specific. Shelf life. <clears throat> Jadam is not for small farmers. Mm. If you want small farmers, stick to Korean natural farming. If you want to step up your game, Jadam is like hammer time. Yeah. 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 KNF is the father. Jadam is the son. I guarantee the son would pound out the father. <laughs> but he wouldn't out of I'm respect. So old, though. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He right, wouldn't right. out of respect. And, and the way of philosophy of the father and son combined, mm. you know, agriculture is, is sometimes a form of martial arts. Right. Yeah. It's about efficiency, it's about common sense. Right. Yeah, it's about environment, right? These are all things in this type of agriculture. It's like you can't just use the product right. without participating in the lifestyle, Dope. right? And what Aloha Organic is, is like we are that dealer that is going to hook you up with that lifestyle without you having to make it. But what we really want is for you to make it. Yeah. If there was a universal switch, you said, Daniel, if there was one thing that – if everybody did this, it would change Hawaii. I would tell you, if everybody used their ways to make nutrients and use them in their own environment, our abundance would be so incredible. Right. Yeah, that Hawaiian family that was using their doodoo of themselves, of their pig, of all their mulch in their aina, of following and doing this, guess what? They didn't even have to leave their homestead. Right. Yeah, kuleana. You never had to leave them. Right. You could just cruise back and you had enough. Now, who has that today? Nobody. A few, maybe? Mm, I, I wouldn't say some. that because everyone's dependent in some sort of way. Um, I, would, yeah. I wouldn't say anybody would be completely self-sustainable at this oh, point yeah. in time, especially yeah. on Oahu where your parcel of land, you're lucky you got over an acre. So, fuck, dude. I know I'm not. What, what we need, you guys, is we need to have highly active farm schools, Ch- right? where we can accumulate all the biomass from a whole bunch of humans and show what happens as one particular solution. You guys have classes at your farm, right? You guys do like a learning thing too, right? Sometimes. or Yeah, what? we do. Definitely. Yeah. Our stuff is a little bit more like um, geared for those that want to seek it, that want mm-hmm. to level up. So we're kind of like the grumpy uncles sometimes, but if you hang around with us, that we will, might smash you with something could change your life. And... When we own our farm, we will start a farm school. Yes. The students of the farm school will actually facilitate. They will be the one-in-one instructors for the community on an everyday basis. That's spreading the so, knowledge. Right now, I'm a, in a capacity building sort of model on the farm school, and actually Aloha Organic plays an important mm. role. What Aloha Organic has been for the farm school is it's a way, right? It's two separate nonprofits that work together. And it mm-hmm. helps us to be able to use the, you know, you can't really teach this stuff unless you scale up. Yep. yep. And, and this is for KNF and it's also for Jadam. Mm-hmm. But what we're finding is like we can go through all of this methodology and create all these different solutions. And it's super amazing if we're going to grow cannabis. Right. Right. It's also amazing if you're a small farmer and you really want to be committed. And, you know, when you feed your plant and you see it grow. 
Well, just imagine you were feeding your plant like other delicious plants. Oh, yeah. Right? And then you're actually watching it literally like lick its lips. Right. <laughs> right? And you're like, oh, my God, this dude is making this OG fresh, you know, turmeric juice on his farm in Kahalu'u. And I'm just hooking up my plant. And then you see your plant. You know, we had a guy tell me his problem is, what was his problem, Brian? Oh, oh. Yeah, one of one of our top clients, he, he he had me real nervous the other day. He's like, "Listen, dude, I, have a, I have a serious problem." I was like, "Shit!" I was like, "All right, well, you know, you know, we'll solve it. We'll, whatever it is, yeah. we'll we'll do it." But just tell me what it is. He said, "So, so all my guys, uh, they're whining because all the flowers are thirty percent larger and more sticky, so they're having problems trimming at the same speed." Wah wah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. <laughs> Said, all right, well, thanks. Moving Lisa, on, buddy. That's fun. a compliment. I can hear yeah. your live on this, your thing, I think. My I thing, I think? I think I can hear your live in my headphones or maybe maybe turn your guys. It is not a tumor. It is. It's in my <laughs> so, brain. Like, that, that convention, like, there's a lot of common denominators in like, <clears throat> what you guys are doing. Um, like I, People that don't even know, Aloha Organics is KNF. KNF is trying to take something that's non-water soluble, fermenting it, and making it water soluble. So by knowing that, that eliminates bottle nutrients. Um, you guys agree, correct? I'm sorry, I was messing with no, my no, no. phone. Can you say that so, again, please? <laughs> uh, Aloha Organics practices KNF. KNF is basically taking something that's an organic, non-water soluble source, fermenting it, and making it into a water soluble source. Correct? Yes. Okay. So that's the mission. That's the that's what these guys are doing. That's the definition of what KNF is. In, in a grand scheme of things, just like, like a simpli simplistic breakdown. If you were to explain it to me, who doesn't? If know I was what? like to talk to another grower, right, that walked into my shop, that's what I would tell them, uh, just to get them, spark their interest in what the fucking mission is. He's like, on transitional language, which is good, getting yes. people interested in it. Uh -huh. I think it's honestly like Buddhism and Christianity. Right. Right. Yeah, I'm, and I'm it's the like guy knocking on your door in the beginning. Fucking, yeah, in the beginning. Right. Unfortunately, you gotta kind of go hardcore. Yeah, and and I don't want to say you gotta go hardcore. What I do is I just show people my five year old avocado tree that's thirty five feet tall on its third batch of avocados. Yeah. I show them pictures of the ulu trees at twenty two months, fifteen feet tall with ulus on top of it. You know, the reality is the proof is in your aina. Yeah. You know, if you're growing cannabis. How do you grow it as a higher level? Some people right. want to achieve that, right? So this may be not for the guy that just wants to just grow it and I don't know what he's doing with it. But if I was going to spend as much time as growers spend with their plants, right? And then if you think of it, if you're going to spend this much time with your plant, don't you want to give it like a gourmet organic feeding system yeah, that yeah. mimics what you eat well the re reciprocity of that too is like the product that comes out of it it's safe to, for consumption because you know where you sourced everywhere you go like we talked about and brian earlier remember about eating meat knowing where it comes from humanely mm. it's fucking nice. slaughtered the same exact thing applies to you guys so you're, you're giving your plant something that was done in the right way where you sourced it yourself hand-picked sourcing not factory farm sourcing you know like bone meal some people get it from slaughterhouses that do factory farming big impact on the fucking environment you know this is you guys are grabbing people's waste you know grabbing like hey you guys got a bunch of fruit you guys can't well, sell let, let's talk about let's talk about bone waste okay yes cal foss yes all right uncle daniel how you how you guys do your cal foss so first of all super important who likes fa broth this okay. Guy, this guy right here. So the beef bone from the wild Big Island beef is sustainably supported by the cowboys that are eradicating that beef. The bone is then brothed in our emu into fa broth. We separate all the good, yummy inside stuff from the rest of the bone. Oh. Then on the following emu, we roast the bone on the emu fire as we're heating the rocks. We cook the bone. <coughs> we pull off the bone. Then we're super blessed to work with a local kombucha company mm. that their bad kombucha is our organic vinegar. Vinegar. Got you. So 
We have certified organic vinegar made locally with wild Big Island beef bone that comes from the Vancouver cows that were given to King Kamehameha the Great back in the friggin' 1800s, 1700s, I think. So, you know, when, when you talk about, when you go and buy your nutrient, I say learn the genealogy of your nutrient, right? Because what I found for many of the agriculture solutions is their products that are taken all over the world. Blend it up in some warehouse, put into a bag, and import it to here, yes. to Hawaii. Yes. The challenge is, right, and this is something that I, that I pose to the greater consuming world of farmers. Like, how do you identify an indigenous farmer? Because I'm going to be straight. Some of the guys I've seen use the most chemicals was Kanakas. Yeah. Right? And then the guys that I really learned to understand deep relationships oftentimes was the, you know, that hippie. Living in YPO Valley. Shout out to Coconut Chris and all of these other guys that have been, they would learn from Kupunas and they were the vessels that held this knowledge till we was Ono for them. I get a lot of questions that um, I encounter at the store, right? Rabbit waste, worm castings, goat feces are all water soluble. What is, di- <coughs> what is different? Between using that, steeping it as a tea, or using a FPJ. I, let me let me clarify. I, I think s- there's a piece to add to the water solubility action. Got it. Go for it. And, and I think that important piece is is microorganism density and diversity. Got it. Right. Uh, along with with some of these nutrients being water soluble, mm-hmm. I think the foundation of of Aloha Organic, the foundation of the nutrient set, is the living part of it right putting the actual the breath of life into the soil into the plants into the nutrients right and so that ultimately is going to be the difference between just a tea and a steep to to mineralize a nutrient nothing's actually going to mineralize nitrogen and carbon faster than microorganisms okay. living in your soil gotcha. that is, that's ultimately their, their function in the biosphere okay so like let's say worm castings um, you know that worms biosphere and they have a really you know that's pretty dense so Let's say if I want to throw some of my waste inside my worm bin, uh, specifically like potassium base, right? Banana hearts, banana skins, whatever you got to do. Um, is it safe to say that that, would, that, that byproduct would be a water-soluble um, potassium source? If it's broken down by microorganisms. Right. If right. you're waiting, when, when, you know, water solubility by plants is really just, is it mineralized by microorganisms gotcha. yet? I mean, that's ultimately what right. we're looking for, right? The black gold of... Yep. So, so Kalei, speak specifically about the worm casting, the rabbit, and the goat, right? So, how, how, um, just what some of, so we have a product called Farm Gold, right? Right. And so we take the spent beer grains, we inoculate it with all six of our solutions, including fish amino acids. We do this in high concentrates mm-hmm. because the beer grains have no nutrients. Gotcha. So we spray this on the beer grains, we ferment them, and then that is the core of what we feed to the pigs. Gotcha. So they get this spent beer grain in high volumes, like 2,000 pounds a week of spent beer grain went into this pig pen. Mm -hmm. What happens in the deep litter system is that the worms live just below where the pigs can root down to. Okay. So they exist in this system and feed amongst and within it. So we do this for five years uh-huh. before we start mining it. And that's basically the fungal microbial composition that when dried, I swear to God, looks like some crazy peat moss stuff that you're harvesting. You had them on the, the roof and shit. That. Oh, on the roof. But I mean, as far as like what the block looks like, yeah, yeah. this is like thousands and thousands of metric pounds of biomass getting put into a small area being double digested by microbes and pigs and then within itself becoming its own living system that i then take apart Mm -hmm. right with cow we take it apart and then we mix it with the char from our emu now we're just having this conversation about char and i really love it because this is where korean natural farming and Hawaiian indigenous practices mm-hmm. are just Korean natural farming is how we talk about how our kupuna we're doing indigenous agriculture. Gotcha. So today, 
and this is only my observations. I want to also make that clear. Like, hey, this is how your grandpa do them, right? You better do them like that or you can get lickings. <laughs> right. So, but Uncle Daniel, I'm a rule breaker because I'm a common sense kind of maker and I need the STEM to, you know, if no matter science, the technology, the math, the engineering in them, ah, you know what I'm saying? Because the PhDs, they all get that. So we get that plus, right? Uncle Kao, he made the term geeky. 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 That's when you're going beyond in the EK. Yeah, you're breaking <laughs> that thing down like Lepo. So. <laughs> Shout out Uncle Kao with Shout the out fucking out. wordage, with bro. With the geeky. Okay, watch out before we hit you with some geeky. So our practice of emu is actually an agricultural practice. Yes. Some people do it as a culinary practice, and the primary thing is to create food for themselves. Mm -hmm. Yes, Our practice is surrounded by actually creating food for the Aina. Mm -hmm. So in the beginning of my um, really voyage in Emus, and when I say it as a voyage, my Aina told me to Emu every single week, and that if I did that, it would feed me. Right. Yeah, it's, it was so clear. When Kupuna from the area uncle kovehi rider came to my house did the first emu i went for put plastic and like pff, pff, when laugh at me push me aside grab the shovel scoop the dirt on side and said brad that's how can i do it pff, plastic come to find out through observation the more that you emu and use the dirt mm. you cook the weed seeds in the dirt the more you emu the less you weed Right, we saw the impact of employing an emu tractor. Right, when emu tractor, think of how stupid this is. You just move the emu. Right. Now get machine. You easy for dig the hole. You just move the emu. Everywhere you emu is less weed, and then you know gotta move the char. Right. Now let's talk about this char. Everybody gonna be mad because I gonna say them. You heard them from me. Most of you guys, you don't know how to stack your rocks and your emu to make quality char it's supposed to reach a certain temperature i'm not bro. talking about stacking them for make your rock hot we can all disagree talk about this and that but i'm gonna tell you if you're making them for feed your aina you want char not ash yep right and you yep. want to heat your rocks up this is where even char not coal char not coal so right, which is, is high this? temperature so is it coal then char then ash it's char ash coal ash right char coal. it's pretty much like this you guys too far if you're at charcoal the charcoal ass coal is like baking <laughs> Coal is like baking. Mm -hmm. Char is like deep frying. Okay. So when the wood is in that high temperature, it expands instead of compacts as it would in baking. And you can tell through key indicators, one of which is color. When you see the blue flame that is an indicator of pyrolysis, you're between 700 and 900 degrees. Yeah. How you get that is through proper wind flow. Right. right. Yeah, and simply you, you create a chimney. You use the rocks to fill in all the gaps, and then you create airflow updraft where it's circular and it pulls it up, and then just that alone pops the temperature to where you need it to be, and then you pay attention. The wood burns from wood to char to ash. So when it turns to char, Pio. that's when you cut the emu and you close it, mm. and you cut the oxygen, and that's what preserves the char. Now, from regular biochar, because me, I nerd out. You go, you look all the UH stuff. They spend $100,000, okay? <laughs> UH, they spend $100,000, make one machine, make one biochar. Guess what? At the end of it, the biochar. No, bro, zero microbial life. Oh, they cooked it all away. It's a vacuum. Yeah, well, that's what the thing does. It, 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 it creates a house for it. So what ends up happening, right, is you get this sterile char, you put it on your aina, and it, then it robs your aina of nutrients. Right. Because you didn't have any nutrients to begin with, and the char didn't have any, and its charge, magnetic charge, was greater than what your soil was. So now your plant gets less. Yep. Yep. This is what we found through observation. Yeah. This mm. is where our practice, so we see what's happening. So first of all, remember I mentioned... We're cooking the beef bone. Mm -hmm. So we got beef bone that is being charred over. So you got this calcium phosphate falling into the burn. At the same time, we take coral and we use up to 20% coral in our emu practice that makes crushed calcium that's getting added to this char. 
Plus, when you heat up the rocks, what do they do? They explode and crack, which those minerals are simultaneously getting added to the char. Now this is Who where the bio lens. Char like that? Who does biochar like that? The Man. lens of Korean natural farming is you gathering microbes from where? Banana and tea leaf. Right? And through, I'll tell you guys what, this is 19, 1933, Allen and Allen, bullet number seven. It's from the University of Hawaii. It talks about the souring of poi. And what it talks about is even under intense heat, the beneficial microbes that are found on poi don't die. And that by cleaning the taro, the microbes transfer from the skin to the corm, and that begins the fermentation process. Dope. So that tells me that in the emu, the beneficial microbes of the banana and the tea leaf are not extinguished. It's only the bad ones. Right. Mm. Right? And then what happens is we pull out our food and we leave the emu. We leave it closed and inoculate the char with the banana and the tea leaf simultaneously while fermenting the tea leaf and the banana stump for three days before we remove that and feed that to the pigs. Right. Because that's another part of the pigs. Now, every month, just to shake it up, because we don't like to use any antibiotics on our animals, we actually feed the animals the char from the emu. And they make a, a char substance that's now been digested by pigs that is now included in the emu char. Right. So we take this micro bridge char from our emu. It's about a 30% blend with the dust from our pig pen. Brian actually had some math. I'm interested to hear what the math is. I'm trying to guess what the, what the biomass ratio. If you think of a 16 by 16 pen that is four feet deep full of uh, biomass that basically is refilled and compacted every single year for five years. What does that really equate to? Yeah. Right. You know, is that 16 by 16 by 40 feet tall after five years that have been compacted into handfuls of soil that are incredibly microbe rich and so broken down and well balanced mm -hmm. that check this out. The guys in uh, Ukiah, what do they do? They top dress right when they get it. Doesn't matter what stage they're top dressing because right. every single time I sent it, except for the last time I shipped it late. So they was already in their season. <laughs> I told them off on the season. So at what point in time does the, the microbials run out of food? Especially when, when the microbial density just compacts down to that size. Uh, when does the food become gone? Where you start going into some, some kind of fucking state where they're hibernating or, you know. This is only true my observations. And this is why... The, the pigs play such an important role. So another one of the key components is coconut husk. Gotcha. This is what the pigs feed on. And I actually happened to be at a fastenal convention in Tennessee some years ago. Uh, and while I was at this convention of like 30,000 different products and their vendor, mm -hmm. the most intriguing product to me was an environmental cleanup product that was made entirely of coconut dust. Oh. And what they talked about was how they use the dust that comes off of the coconut core factory in Thailand, and you can have an environmental catastrophe, oil, gasoline, diesel, spread this dust on it. What happens is that the coconut has this incredible retention ability. Everything. So it yeah. can hold this gasoline for like 50 years in a landfill situation. So what happened was I came home, right? And this is where learning about Jadam became very kind of important in my practice was I started taking coconut, dried coconut husk, making the Jadam solutions and then soaking the coconut husk. In yes. It. And then, and it's a substrate right? for your fucking, your microbes. Yeah. Yep. Like biochar. And right. then I planted Ava yep. and I realized that the coconut, will last five it will last as long as it takes the ava to eat it so there's still chunks of coconut five years later of husk in the ava but 80 percent of it has actually been consumed by the ava See. so you're talking about like well how can you tell when you need more well i can tell when i have zero coconut husk like holy shit this thing ate it right mm -hmm. for me my philosophy is different I feed my aina always. Every part of my practice, my byproduct, human manure, animal manure, green mass, right, through plants, uh, logs, 
compost, whatever it is. I just dug a hole the other day. I just put in like 100 pounds of fish guts because I didn't have time to make FAA with it. And I just buried it right there in my front yard. And I didn't even think twice. Right. Yeah, and we're doing it in that amount and adding the LAB for no smells, faster breakdown, just puts more nutrients right in the area. I'm not thinking about feeding the plant. I'm thinking about feeding the planet. Right, that's just my daily practice. This is where I want to encourage, like, you got Brad, you guys live Hawaii, like, be Kanak and figure out how to feed your Aina or feed the Aina. Yep. Right, because we live, the trauma and land is so generational and so deep. You know, just the other day, I, I, I don't know, I realized it, I found out why, you know, Maui Onion so famous. Why was Maui Onion developed? I don't know. Wow, Maui onion and cabbage was Get ready. Was, was <laughs> sent to the all the soldiers on the front line of the war. Oh no shit. And so our beef went to the war, our cabbage, our onions went to the war, our pineapples went to the war. Huh. Bro, we fed the invasion of how many countless countries in the history that bro, I don't know if America wouldn't have been able to do it without us. Right. Right? And the consequence of us feeding these wars is that we, our food system was replaced with canned goods. Yes. True. So it was like a war on simultaneous fronts right. where they commoditize our ability to produce high-nutrient foods. Now, they've done it for so long that all of our soils are dead, right? I get calls every single day, don't call me. If you're <laughs> out there, do not call me. I don't even care what your problem is. It's your problem. Feed your Aina. I just told you the solution. Don't ask me how. Figure it out. Well, how you walk, how you poop, how you pee, how you eat. If everything you do feed your Aina, bro, right, you're good. At some point, your Aina going to feed you. Right. right? How do we build up that relationship? And the shortest amount of time is always what people ask me. So how you do that is with freaking microbes. Because it's already broken down into the form that your Aina can eat. And also changing the mentality of... Let's not do it for us. Do it for our kids. Simple as that. Like, you may not see the fucking result, but hey, the next generation will. So if you want this shit to keep on going, change your practices up a little bit. And, you know, like for people at home, I, don't, I know Uncle Daniel's not even fucking saying that like everybody needs to change right now. But a slow progression, one at a time, just changing a little bit about your life will give you the inspiration to try and change a little more and change a little more. Before you know it, you're full blown in the mix of, you know, what what do you call it? What did Uncle Carl call it? Geeky. Geeky. Yeah. Yeah, it's a change reaction. Yeah. yeah, and then it's amazing because I believe that the the internet is gonna be the platform where we can all change simultaneously to probably something super inspirational or super depressing. We're gonna see something together live. You know, and it's going to affect and change us all. I just hope that we're all prepared for that change. Right? And I don't want to be the chicken little. But one <laughs> of the things, yeah. Um, sky is falling. Yeah, for... uh, um, look, they tell us every single day that 85% of what we consume is imported. But I want everybody to, to stop looking at that statistic and start looking at their fridge. And if you look at your fridge, you realize that 99% of us is 100% imported foods. 100%? Yeah. Everything in a bottle, everything in a can, guarantee in a plastic bag was freaking imported. Yeah. Even maybe the vegetables at the farmer's market that you thought was local, but was really from Costco, <laughs> rebranded, repackaged, right? So you can't even trust where your food comes oh, from. Fuck, so man. I don't want to completely go down this rabbit hole, but what I want to reinforce is like this, this whole concept is like how do you connect with farmers? Yeah. How do you recognize the indigenous farmers, right? Uh, this, is, this is where I don't want to say, like, always it's a risk to try anything, yeah? But I'm going to tell you guys, get local guys, get, get people that believe in this Aina, that we are putting out a product that we use and we see. And I'll be honest, if I could give this stuff away, I would. And if you really look at how our business is built... Okay, so let's talk about Hui Aloha Animal Mona for just a second, which is the nonprofit organization mm -hmm. that um, I get the joy to participate in helping to see and grow. Since COVID has happened, not only we've given out over 40,000 huli, mm -hmm. we've helped others in the community establish their own no-smell pig pens. Yeah, we've gone through 
countless tarot pollinating workshops and tarot distribution and supplying. And, and the reality is out of all of this work that we do, there is byproduct and waste. Yes. Yeah, from our tarot pounding class, we have extra tarot skins and scrapings every single week that if I didn't have 20 pigs, I wouldn't be able to deal with all of this waste. Yeah, right. Yeah, so it's like now that waste at some point became a product that Aloha Organic actually buys from the nonprofit, mm. right? This is where our model is is I want to say strangely but crazily different from other models. This is the dream. Mm -hmm. The dream is that I'm going to call the boys from Olokai with the deer problem, all the bones all over the place, and the whole canaks. I send in over 40, 55-gallon drums of the organic <laughs> vinegar, and um, you guys are going to make the cow fossil over there, and then we're going to brand it as a Molokai product, fertilizer. Not Monsanto, but actually creating nutrients yep. from Molokai. Right. right? Yep. Yep. That we're going to reach out to the Adabratos over there, not just the farmers, but like, oh, cause Kauai had a lychee mega season and it's all falling from the trees, Bratos. We're going to send you guys 20 tons of brown sugar. Yeah, and you guys are going to make the FPJ lychee. And, and we have a global market of, of, of guys that grow cannabis that want to feed their cannabis the most ridiculous, audacious, delicious nutrients from Hawaii. <laughs> Right? It's kind of like, well, what did your cannabis eat today? Right? Not what did you smoke? What are you feeding your plants? And, and then how does it make you feel? And then you got people that are going to be crazy enough that are going to show up yeah. during ahi season to catch an ahi, only to clean their ahi and put that ahi into the batch of the 2022 FAA cup. Yeah? And we're using all the waste from ahi fever to make nutrients that is going to help Y and I to be more sustainable, right? right. This is where the That's nutrient awesome. base and the community is so incredible, mm -hmm. right? And I don't want to like down on like imported stuff, but it already is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And if you believing this and, and if you believing like your solution will come from someplace else, it won't save me. Yeah. Um, maybe you're not geared necessarily to live on an island and that's okay. So how you can support, you can go and buy a t-shirt on Aloha Organic. <laughs> you don't even have to use any of our practices. You could just wear a cool shirt, be like, ha-ha. Um, <laughs> you could go to Hui Aloha Animal Mona and make a, like a monthly donation um, so that we can use that to invest in new farmers. Because what we need to not do is try to change all the guys that are out there doing it kind of lazy. And just invest in a whole new generation of people that appreciate walking instead of maybe like speeding by mm. that want to see the sides of the road maintained properly and are willing to like raise some sheep and do it. Right. Because how sick would it be to see on the side of the road like actual sheep herder grazing some sheep on the side of H1? And if you're telling me there ain't enough grass for us to grow cows and sheep on the fucking Department of Transportation Road, I can tell you your shit is from Costco. Right. And like, here's all of these resources that because we don't see it as nutrients, we don't know how to manage it properly. Right. Right. We look at it as waste. Can your products be used just for like people who are growing plumeria in their back? Can it be like all plants? Is it good for everything or is it specifically like tailored we're actually to we're actually not a food? cannabis company We're we're actually a, a, a land remediation company. And if you make it yourself, you can ball your plants out with everything that you eat. Yeah, everything that comes into my system somehow is made into a fertilizer that goes back to my plants. And that circuit in my life mm -hmm. is absolute. They feed me. I feed them. We freaking super smash. So all the plumerias in my yard, all the pool, Kenny Kenny, all the crown flower, all the tea leaf, all the taro, all the sweet potato. I mean, every single thing, big, tall trees. I'm out there on a ladder sometimes in the tree because... You know, everybody get this uh, avocado like rust. Mm -hmm. It's like this microbe growing on the back of the leaf. Yeah. So I just make sure if I just hit it with the, we call it one, it's the uh, indigenous herbal solution, uh, vodka base. That, that, that insect doesn't like it. You don't need mm -hmm. to put a lot. And the more regular you do it, the less you get. Mm -hmm. right. And so when I can't hit the low leaves, I'm putting the ladder up to hit the tall leaves because my DeWalt sprayer 
And also like the atomizers. That works really well in atomizer. Yeah. Or like misting your plants. Wow, and just hit it and you just see it go. Cause that's like why a you're talking about. All the atomizer sponsors out there. You could also go to my website, send me an email, let me Info. know you want to make a donation. <laughs> What's the email? Where's that? Tag, tag Petra right here. Yeah. <laughs> Pet, yeah. Daniel at Aloha Organic. Um, dot org. But Steel, Steel makes a sprayer blower too that goes 30, 40 feet. Yeah. I hit koas with it and tall bamboo with that. So that, the thing's ridiculous. Yeah, and I think most of us don't don't really have a connection with our, our yard and our lawn in the way of feeding it outside of chemical fertilizers. And if you think of like all your pets, mm. they really to me the cutting edge where our company is gonna change the game. In cannabis, guys are gonna make their own guarantee. But I'm going after lawn care, guys. We're specifically going Golf after courses. organic lawn care of small, no, small, just Yards. people that want to have badass looking lawns right, that yeah. not killing the dog. Right. Yeah. Because you love your dog or your lawn more. And, you know, like what, in Eva Beach where it's kind of hard to grow anything. Yeah. <laughs> and like at, at our shop, a lot of people was buying it wasn't the fucking ganja growers. The ganja growers, they tune into YouTube, see Jungle Boys. Oh, I want Athena. They're right there. But the people that were buying it and buying it like pretty consistently were landscapers. Like I noticed this one auntie would come in, straight beeline to the grow. Boop. She used to put in her fucking sprayer, spraying lawns, and she was a landscaper. So you know what I mean? That's your responsibility as a business, in my opinion, leaving your fucking f- footprint everywhere. If you're going to uh, take contracts on and you're bouncing here and there, make sure you're responsible what you're doing in that sense. And there's alternatives out there. People are just so like, tied into the fucking the old system so on that lawn care topic um we're working on a project out in wailua on north shore stables and um i think right now they got about 35 acres alongside the river um no i'm not saying that they're doing full restoration and it was kind of like one of those things, you know, you go and talk to somebody and then they hear that feeding their land is going to cost them seven to 10000 a month. And they get a little bit like, uh, I'll get back to you. Mm. So, you know, over multiple conversations, you know, Adam was a believer, but cost is something that we all think about. Yeah. Right. 100%. So uh, he actually bought a landscape bucket, which is about 400 bucks. I dropped off a two gallon sprayer. I said, bro, just spray the part of your lawn that sucks. Mm. And in the evening, he started spraying the lawn. And within a week, actually within the next two days, he was sending me videos about, oh, my God. And I thought, ah, this guy, <laughs> this guy just drinking beers, talking about his lawn. Being uh, super <laughs> optimistic. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know me. I was like, ah, you, but you probably just, you know. Um, well, after, after two weeks of just spraying uh, every other evening, he said, you know what, Daniel? I want to try once a month. So come in. I'm going to order five gallons of every single solution. We're going to put it in this 2,000-gallon water truck. We're going to do three passes, do 6,000 gallons of spray at 1,000 to 1. Basically, the last one's a little more loose. Um, and we'll just see what happens. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm just going to try that. I'm going to just trust that what you're saying is going to work. Mm-hmm. Within the next day, the first thing that they notice immediately different not as much flies Mm. yeah it's like mm, who doesn't have a fly problem if you don't think flies and agriculture are connected and the chemicals that you put on top of your land if those aren't symbiotic then you just don't want to see it right 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 lactic acid bacteria which you can make right by just adding that regularly into your system it will help your system be more robust right will help to fight any type of infections Right, it's a kind of like a natural inoculator, i.e., sanitizer per se, but it makes flu it, shot, you know, right? Difficult, right? I get this. Our lactic acid bacteria comes every Thursday. We make poi. I take a little bit of the water from the taro cleaning, and I take the starch water from mixing the poi on the board. I combine that with the milk. That's the base for our lactic acid bacteria. Right. We're collecting it off taro and breadfruit. Right. Right, so I, you're feeding your land taro microbes. Tell me that's bad. It's going right, right? back into where it came from. All, all, of the, all of the chemical nutrients that are out there, 
there's somebody that is is will say like, oh, this is bad, this is good. Come on, let's really talk about where if you break it down, we're feeding poi microbes to your lawn. And we think of what taro patches were doing for thousands of years. Were they not also spreading poi microbes everywhere throughout our islands through the Awai system and the 20,000 acres of Lo'i lands? Right. Makes sense. And, you know, that's just food practices. That's responsibility. That's everyone should be thinking in that direction. You know, we talk about we're talking about food security. Um, that's a big player in all of that. And people overlook all of that shit. You know what I mean? That's like that's where that's the base brick and mortar of where all our food is going to come from in Hawaii. And that's the practices that's going to provide that on the big agricultural sense. You know, um, fuck profitability fuck everything else it's it's the thing that's gonna when the ships stop coming that's what's gonna go down you know and another thing i wanted to touch on was i i took that tissue culture class a lot of the tissue culture explanations that they talk about hormonal manipulations and that subject transit transition uh, translates to other practices like jeff lowenfeldt's and L- elaine ingram and all those other guys that has the same properties or the same baseline of what they're trying to get get into you know um cloning um using auxins using um, fucking hormones that you only find in the tips of the plants guess what the cows graze what are they getting the fucking auxins on top of the grass as they're chewing it right they're not ripping the grass out they're grazing so their gut biome is now taking that auxins and all that lacto uh, bacillus from the tips of the grass into their stomachs fermenting it now it's transitioning to their milk we give the milk a fucking food source which is the rice wash or kala wash yep. boom now we've cultured we've given the that that enzyme that fucking microbe that comes with that hormone all through into that fucking solution so it's it's not like em1 and i hate to ba- i'm not bashing em1 people love it but like how you guys are saying it's a cultured microbe right it's something that's synthetically cultured to take the place of lactobacillus. However, we find lactobacillus in our cow milks, and I think that's why it's important to even get cow milk from a local source when you're doing your, your labs. Because, I mean, if you're getting fucking Kirkland milk, you're getting Ohio's fucking milk and bringing it here in Hawaii, we don't want that shit. It's pasteurized. You know, we don't want all that shit. We want I can tell you guys, milk. it's hard to find raw, available milk anywhere in the islands. Maybe 20 years ago, but today, I don't think there's a single dairy on Oahu. I was lucky. Didn't they pass laws to make like raw milk illegal and shit it to is. like sell it and is. deal with it? It is definitely. Well, I wanted to stop because you can't just roll a three paper joint, sir, <laughs> and not remark on it and just glaze over and just lie I, it without I, fucking war telling people. I'm thankful for. So it. one of the I'm things that. For it. Yes, uh, <laughs> so one of the things that always happens is we he rolls a fat fatty, and um, <coughs> what the fuck was I gonna say? <laughs> God, it's it. already working. Yeah. 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 I just blew it up. Oh, off. shit. No, no. Yeah, yeah. We always ask our guests, when was the first time you got high? We never even did that. We just got straight into everything. Uh. So let's have a fucking question. <laughs> Brian, let's go first with you. When was the first time you got high or was it when you smoked? And then if that's a different time for when you yeah. got high, you know what I'm saying? Fair enough. Fair enough. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure I was high. I probably just had zero idea to <laughs> decipher the fact that it was true. Um, I think that would have been uh, so after basketball. I think I knew that it was going to be an everyday affair, so I tried to delay it as much as possible. Somewhere around junior year of high school was when that began. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, joints all the way back to whatever house we went to, and then a series of bong rips until the nap, and then a wake up into food. Oh. Yeah, and a repeat. And then and that was that was the first day, and it was, it was probably every day since. You're fucking fortunate to have such a fucking... Yeah. Tailored first day where it's like I get to have a weed nap, wake well, up. Well, I kind of stake out. Joints, I'm not sure I was. I'm not sure the nap was entirely peaceful. I think we just encapsulated it for the story. Now that, that I did in fact fall asleep. <laughs> yeah. Damn. Uncle Daniel. I think I can actually remember the, my first. I clearly recall it was in Hilo. Mm-hmm. It was 100 uh, percent borrowed from my uncle. Oh shit! Yeah. Whether or not he was knowing that he was loaning us this <laughs> cannabis or not, um, 
the <laughs> earliest time uh, of my of my memory, um, like of actually like getting busted, was in sixth grade. Oh shit! And I had this reoccurring dream, and in my dream it was very dark. And as I it was like I was sitting in a circle. And I was looking around, kind of like looking at you guys, but it, just imagine it was dark and there was like, I could see fire in your eyes. And right when something was about to happen, everybody got scared. And I, I had this dream like three or four times. And um, this was like OG, freaking uncle <laughs> wasn't paying attention. We went to his one gallon jar, freaking tax couple nugs. Uh, did not know the difference in rolling papers. We took a paper bag, like you know, okay. one of those paper shopping bags. I think yep. we might have tried to be real smart and peel it in half. It was brown though, so yeah, you're brown, good. You know? Brown, brown paper bag, and then we rolled a crude joint. And then, as kids, we went camping on the weekends. Where in Kilkaw, right across the street from Richardson's, mm -hmm. and our family would just let us straight. Six, no, fourth, third grade. You go beach sleepover. If you like sleepover, go. So there we are camping, sitting around the fire. Smoking a joint, making like we all adult in sixth grade. Right there, I look up. Holy shit. This is my dream. And right when I'm about to say oh, it. Oh, the fire in people's eyes from the campfire. Bro, my uncle had crept up on us. Oh. And was watching us freaking smoke the joint while he was in a tree. And then he jumped out of the tree and scared the shit out of us. The freaking joint went one way. <laughs> oh, no, no. Oh, we were smoking ash from the fire. <laughs> Later on, Uncle was like, bro, I saw you guys fucking... I Bro, I looked at the weed from on top of the tree. I know you guys stole it from me. <laughs> I saw you guys roll the fucking joint and then pass it around like five times before I jumped out. Okay, it's like, be lying to you, Uncle Got you. Boy. Busted. That's a great fucking story. That's a good way. And what? Have you been a regular smoker since then, or you know did that what? scare you enough to like not try it again? Like the fact that a, dr a reoccurring <laughs> dream you've been having just like came to fruition, and then simultaneously your uncle scared the living shit out of you and your friends. Like holy fuck. That would scar me for life. <laughs> I'd be like, uh, yeah, nah, right? I'm good on. The, I'll pass on the weed for a little bit. <clears throat> I've had this uh, ailment. Since I was a kid, probably since birth, where I'm like my worst enemy and my mouth gets me into trouble. And when my mouth and my mind are properly aligned, then sometimes things that are said should not have been said. And um, as a child, <laughs> as a child, um, I had zero filter. My filter was, I didn't realize I had one. Right about, I ran away in 11th grade. And I started smoking weed. And I started realizing that I didn't have to say everything that came into my mind. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of slowed down. I have really severe ADHD, like incredible. Uh, I prefer to like, if you look at how I walk on my farm, I like do like 40 things to like walk down to the bathroom. I've like picked up, fed the pigs, trimmed this, planted that. While I'm like, this is like my normal everyday <laughs> existence, you know? Look the weather, mahalo something, boom, just are prior you, to cannabis. Are you di diagnosed with like ADHD or it's just like you notice the behavioral patterns you have and like you recognize that? Because I feel the same way. I've never been diagnosed clinically, but fuck, I feel the same fucking way a lot of the time. They wanted to give me, I think it's Ritalin, mm -hmm. when I was when I was growing up, but I was like the, I was like the doctor's grandson, so they they kind of just like let me be like a little bit crazy, um, and then my family personally sent me to Hilo, Cannabis as is much the one, as they man. could, um, and I was an absolute shithead until I started smoking weed. Right. What did it cure? It first cured my shitheadism. Yeah. That. <laughs> has held me back forever that in plagues my a own lot life. of people actually fuck yeah a lot of people could cure their shitheadism with fucking cannabis. cannabis it's not that hard man it's pretty like that thing could save a lot of kids that's poorly diagnosed that just need some fucking <laughs> weed like you could just do it in a safe <laughs> way where they could consume and be medicated and you know how like i think i would be a better student if i was able to smoke and, and go to class without having to worry, you know. I don't think I would have acted a fool. I think it would have kept me in check. And then it, 
that hyper focus when you're super stoned, I think that would have helped me, you know, going to school. Prescribing children amphetamines does not help. Yeah, right? You, you think it would. Like, I mean, come on, guys. Like, fuck. I feel it, it, this is what I just want to share when we talk about youth, yeah? And especially for yourself, Kali, yeah? I want you to imagine that you grew up in a way that it was totally okay for your family to grow their own medicine and create their own lao. Yeah, and that there was no separation <coughs> between something that you could grow and give to grandma and grandpa to help with their pain or mom and dad sometimes mm -hmm. to deal with their stress, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Like all of the, the real remedy and benefits were just a part of our everyday life and practices. When right. you think of like simple things from like CBD cream and different types of ways to, to take cannabis, there's so many different ways outside of of how we consume it in in either smoking or you know eating that are beneficial to our body growing up in that fashion i want you to imagine that you grew up in a household where how you feel now was instilled from birth in you yep and and then it was never even like you knew that if you felt this way that you could go outside and grab some buds in this back room and boom you were all good like and it wasn't even like mm -hmm. how incredible would your relationship be if the infancy of your life where you're fascinated by freaking everything if you had something as amazing as cannabis as a part of your regular life, how that would help you. 100%. With your ADHD. Yeah, 100%. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And then that's your medicine to help you with the other part of the ADHD, which is surviving, living in an effing box called school. Wow. Right? What did COVID teach me? <coughs> that my kids at never go school was the best prepared and the most ready for learn everywhere they go. Right. And the moment that there, there was no... I go to school to learn, and life is how I learn. My kids is into that all the time. Yeah, yeah. Every single uncle that comes by, and this guy can attest to it. Bro, my kids grow you. Boom, they're doing social study, current events right now. What's going on, <laughs> uncle? Yeah. You have any resources I can plunder? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> what kind of food did you bring? Creating lifelong <laughs> learners. So that brings me to like a, a pretty good point where, you know, how you're you're preaching that the. Uh, sudden intervention of sustainable practices you know whether it be whatever you're doing you're feeding the land you're feeding the i know um it's really a fight for the next generation that that vision that you had imagine but, but i want to tell you you can also grow fucking amazing weed and save the ina and do it for the next generation exactly like there's zero uh <laughs> it actually only gets better and it's like, you don't know until you know. And with this KNF shit, it takes like seven years. Right. Promise. They say 15. I've experienced results that people literally come to my house and then they're just like, nah, can never duplicate this. It's like, you're special, Daniel. Then we take them to other sites where we've done exactly the same thing, except in a more refined situation. And they're like, <laughs> right. right? Choking on freaking Ulu's at 22 months. It's like, uh huh. Come, it comes down to this. If you feed the land, it now has the capacity to feed you. Oh, guaranteed. Yeah. If you feed the plant, then you just don't feed the plant. You never feed the land. The land is in the same situation as it was before you put the plant in them. Yeah? When the aina is the momona, the aina come fat, then the, the plant grow effortless. Right. Yeah? Totally. And, you know, that's why I'm trying to transition to where <clears throat> that's – Factory, I and mean, that's farming, right? That's that's responsible farming in 2022. You know, let's look back 10, 15 years ago. That was in its infancy. People were using chemical farming. Okay, um, this is going to transition to the next generation. So, next generation, nine times out of ten, profitable farming is going to be cannabis. You know, <laughs> with, with the way things are going, hopefully they're not going that way. But if they do, big businesses will be fucking cannabis, and a lot of it will be indoor cannabis farming. So those are the guys, along with golf courses, you know, those, those big parcels of hectares of land that's been fucking sprayed and, and treated like a bitch. That's the guys that go after. That's the guys who attack with this mindset because that's the guys that's going to make the full fucking impact. A lot of Hawaii is townhomes, apartments. They can't do that kind of farming. But the caveat to that is the mentality needs to change. Whether it be you're in a fucking high rise or you got acres and acres of land, 
that mentality of re- reciprocating what you've got. So the good, the goods that I have, bless you, the goods that I have up in you know my fucking apartment all the way up here, I need to support something that's going to be sustainable to the land. So it's a responsible purchase on my part, right? So that's the targeting the next generation because as we get more gentrified, the resources become more finite, and we got to have guys that's going to step up, and it's going to be big parcels or big companies they got to take it upon themselves or actually be forced by laws or whatever to farm in a responsible manner that's not going to fucking impact us that's the that's the direction you guys are headed right um in more of like a a a micro farmed managed uh, micro farmed uh sort of speak sense but the guys that are coming over are steam steam rolling in are the big entities you know the the fucking tourism's the fucking you know what I mean like those guys are the guys that are, are really raping I, our fucking land. I will tell you this to all the listeners that are participating in the industry. Your requirement is to dream bigger. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that if we as as the Kama Aina, as Nakeki Okia Aina, as we hold that space down, we leave less room for for others to come in. When I think about the quality of what is being produced and who's producing the highly sought after cultivars of food and medicine, it's all people associated with organic farming practices. Yeah. Outside of, of um, papayas, which unfortunately, you know, I'm really looking for a good organic line of papayas, but I want to make sure that it, it is certified organic because I've had this papaya phobia about eating this GMO papaya that nobody is, you know, basically, you know how I eat a papaya? I look at it. If it has a ring spot, I eat it. Because <laughs> then, you know what I'm saying? They GMO it for against the ring <coughs> spot. Yeah, yeah. But outside of the papaya, there's absolutely zero labeling and zero talking <laughs> about what is the genetic genealogy of our food and who grows it, right? And this is the change that, you know, if you would have grown up, right, in our spam generation and yeah. fancy cereal and orange, you know, that red <laughs> juice noodles, at the potty, pockets. oh, smashing, right? <laughs> now, get one down to earth in Kapule and one Whole Foods, two Whole Foods on Oahu, right? This is where I look at the reality for people is like, you guys, the demand for food and medicine that uses local, organic, sustainable products is untapped compared to the demand for just the everyday commercial products. Commercial like, organic. You know, that stuff's available and people will eat it if that's all they have to eat. But what Whole Foods has proven is that somebody will pay more for something that has a better story, a better relationship, yeah. higher quality nutrients. Yeah. And I and I see how that's going to be applied. This is what's going to happen, you guys. When we talk about corporations, these corporations are either going to commoditize natural farming almost in the essence of what aloha organic has done and putting a bottle and a label on it but they're going to make it at such a huge scale because they have the most industrial waste yeah but i will tell you you know what happens if that happens what's that (coughs) we win because there's now very there's no industrial waste they're using all the products to feed the aina yeah right right and so it's like trick them if my greatest fear <laughs> exactly is you, you it copying me is like, Brad, that's actually not my greatest fear. Like, I want to say that our organization believes in this solution, that it is a solution. Yeah. And I promise you, whether it's now or later, this is the direction that everybody is going on. Yeah. And you have a chance to support a local company focusing on indigenous microbes that actually impacts our community on a regular basis, you know, for your nutrients, that's basically what we're competing against. Right. And I don't mean it in a competition, but the real competition should be, are you inspired enough to make your own? Mm-hmm. Right? That's what we want to do. Our goal is to inspire you to say, actually, Uncle Daniel, you're the number two best nutrient company. Because number one, shit. right? This is like, we've I, let's, let's talk about straight company Can, beefs. But is this something somebody could do like, I live in Ewa Beach. I have a small backyard. Can I do it in my hibachi on my grill? Like, definitely. How the like? I don't have space. Definitely. I, you know what I mean? You could definitely do that. Shit. You can. You can. Believe it or not, you can bake it in your oven. 
Oh, for a okay. long enough time for this stuff to happen, and then if you put in a little bit garlic, onion, show you below it, you can have make smell like you're making Kobe. Yeah, uh-huh. I'm like no, I'm not burning bone, Auntie. I'm making Kobe, but I don't know what happened. I just like I my Kobe extra that. crispy. Yeah, some you can, some obviously you can. The the rotting fish. So wait, wait, let's talk about this real quick. Well, FAA smells FAA, pretty damn good. FAA though. is like, good. It's like light che- like like out of crack point. seed, you know, yeah. like the storage space. Mm. But this is where we have a beef, okay? This is like a, this is a far back intercompany scrap, right? Um, we have a few of these in our organization. We're not a perfect organization. We're a nonprofit organization. What do we beef about? Uncle Daniel, stop yelling at customers for buying seawater solution. Okay? Okay. Brah! I calling up guys, brah. Who's this? Kimo. Kimo. Yeah, you order 62459. Yeah. What, bro? You know, can take your kid to the beach first thing in the morning, go gather some freaking seawater at the crack of dawn, bro. Like, bro, I seen your last name. It's like freaking, like, you know what I'm saying? Multi, multi vowels. School dawn on patrol last one name. day with a many who have multi, multi, uh, multi vowels. Right? So it's like, here, here's the, here's like the, I want you guys to like appreciate this understanding, yeah? That when you go to gather during the times that the microbes are most abundant, it's honestly the most beautiful time to be in Hawaii. Yeah. yeah. And I go in and see the sunrise, sunrise at yeah. Kualoa. I see it before the sunrise. Yeah. And, and in my practice, I get to see microbes. So I show up when they're there and they're there. And when you see them and you recognize them and then you catch a couple of them. Right. And it's about how you caught some microbes or try it. Mm-hmm. Right. It's either there's microbes in it or my black magic is like, wow, like voodoo powers of making shit grow, right? Um, That's that's who wouldn't want to participate in that Dawn Patrol, right? right? And then incorporate that Dawn Patrol into your agricultural practice, right? Do you surf just to surf or did you surf to Malama Yoaina? And, and maybe while you're surfing and you're catching them, you're seeing an invasive species, you're seeing another plight that's happening simultaneously in our aina. Yeah, when you go to the store and you go straight to the store and you go and buy the thing that came inside salt, one bag of salt, what are you participating in? Because every story of salt that I read about that I see on Discovery Channel is about some indigenous community getting exploited pennies on the dollar so that we can have a cheap-ass bag of salt over here. Right. Yeah, and I think to myself, damn it, all right, here's my choices. Rape and pillage some other indigenous community that's just like me, yeah? Um, go to alohaorganic.org and spend eight bucks for some seawater solution. Or C, now I got to spend $5 a gallon gas to go drive down to the beach mm. to go take my kids for a dawn patrol. Right. Like, out of which of those three... Is honestly best for you, me, and the planet. Dawn Patrol. Yeah. And we want people to apply that in other parts of their agriculture practice. Look, this is the difference, yeah? Straight up. Ain't nobody ever sprayed Roundup felt good inside of themselves. Yeah. Let's be real. Yeah. Talk about how safe it is. I don't care how safe. Does it make you feel good? Would you have your baby roll around in that Roundup right after you spray it? Nope. I tell you what, every single product from Aloha Organic, I have my kids rolling around in my damn pig pen. One time, my boy, he was actually eating the fermented beer grains that were sprayed with all six of our solutions, okay? One time, I was doing a demonstration, and my partner labeled the indigenous herbal nutrient wrong, and it was actually that vinegar and beef bone solution, the oh, cow falls, and I took a major swig of it, okay? Yeah. Yeah, still alive, never die. I drank my own. I tasted the FAA. I've drank cups of the LAB. The FAA is pretty damn Every good, single though. FPJ I like I've put on ice cream. What? You'd put your agricultural product on ice cream. Uncle, tell me what is product it? you got in your store. You go home and put them on ice cream and give them to your kid. Because let me tell you, the fermented strawberry juice was freaking whack. Holy I mean, it's shit! Brown sugar and fucking strawberries. And organic strawberries. Okay, stop me now, so right? Dave we got that with banana. We got that on ulu, right? How does that excite yeah, you? Right. It's a syrup. You Brown, make your plant excited. Yeah. 
He made a strawberry syrup. That, that went out. Sorry about that. That sounds super fucking good, man. See how I get excited about microbes? Because it reminds me of eating, and I get to feed my aina the same things that I eat and get excited about that. We get to use waste to create resources, build lepo, see this whole process happen, use pigs, eat good bacon, china box, pizza oven. I mean, this is like, who wouldn't want to live this life? Right. And if the portal to living this life, I mean, for real, who doesn't want to? And if that meant you had to quit your job and grow food to feed your family so that you had the time to don patrol, because if you look at how much it costs to feed your family, it's like a second job. Yeah, if you're fucking doing it all yourself. <clears throat> right? I mean, you look at the cost. Who hasn't gone into the grocery store in the last, like, week and their jaw wasn't freaking whopped? Oh, you're like, you're like, bruh. You went time oh supermarket. God. You taught you in Whole Foods. Fuck, <laughs> <laughs> for real, huh? And that's oh all bottom shelf God. produce. Are you guys feeding like your animals like the byproducts of your plants? Like after you harvest cannabis and shit, like the stalks, the leaves, all that shit. That trim, like maybe not trim, but like all that shit. Does I, that get fed to things? I've gotten excess from um, growers and added it right in my pig pens. But generally, we grow banana, tea leaf, uh, sugar cane, pellet, chaya. Uh, Kalamungai, and these are all the plants that just surround the pig pen. So when we're lazy, we don't have other types of food. We fly that in. That's what they eat. Because I heard a story, like, back in the day before the banning of cannabis, like, all livestock was fed, like, byproduct of hemp and shit. Because it was legal, right? Everybody grew it. Everybody had it. It's a lot of biomass. Right? They fed it to their animals and everything. So now people, by second hand, were getting CBD and all these kind of different cannabinoids through the milk through the eggs through even through the meat of these animals right so i'm just wondering if that's uh, something people do and if that's even still happening like right that's some next level stuff bro when you're smoking what your pig is eating <laughs> you know you yeah. just like it circles within circles and the, it's another one of those loops that you can close up yeah. <laughs> and and ultimately what does that get you but I get you uniqueness mm-hmm. yeah what separate white hole white cane is this a such a taint flavor but the, the differences in the Kahlo ainas, lines, right? Kahlo. Kahlo is, yeah. is could be slight, but they're mm. both incredibly delicious. And because the flavor of those places, it's consistent. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you eat the taro from this place. It tastes different than the taro from that place. Or can, you, don't you see cannabis heading in that same direction? We were talking about that on the growers panel about um, artesian growing and um, how microclimates play a big factor. And what my response was the indigenous microorganisms. So in different microclimates, there's different populations of microorganisms that thrive, out competing the other ones. So where you would get in Iel, you would grow fucking a master kush. Down in Eva, completely different. Because yeah, everywhere on these islands is a different fucking so microclimate. So I, I, I every, like you guys imagine every that so every microclimate. Unique had one strain, the farmers didn't compete with the other microclimates. They focus on that strain in that place. You're going to live here. You're going to probably grow on one of these trees. The one of those trees that you have is the killerest, crippest, chronic ever of that strain. I don't care where you're from in the world. You bring that, you come to that spot, you, you're going to wish that you had either more money, more pigs, more something to trade with these Kanaka bratas that is literally like throwing it away because they're tired of smoking it. They've been smoking well, it every day. Right, okay, so that goes into a fucking wormhole. So that acclimation of that becomes an heirloom. So now that strain becomes an heirloom. That strain genetically changes because of its microclimate. So now when people seek breeding of Hawaii strains, now that we know from Sister May that we did have Hawaii strains before we had Hawaii strains, but these microclimates change the fucking genetic makeup of these plants, making it fucking unique. Can't find it anywhere. So it's, it's not a land race. You can't call it a land race, but you can call it a fucking heirloom, which is a perfectly acclimated strain to that specific microclimate. You know? I mean, that's what all the Kahlo varieties are, mm-hmm. you know? right? And that's what Maui Waui... Molokai Centipede, Kauai Electric, these are all these heirlooms that 
We're very fortunate. Guess what? We get to be the generation that gets to experiment with the thousands of weed strains to figure out what is the heirloom variety in your area. If we do it in a brilliant way, we build upon each other's success in such a way that the local people control the land and water, Mm -hmm. right? Our brilliance is absolute. Where we lack is our ability to work together and forgive each other. Right. Yeah? That's ultimately probably because we're poor communicators. But you know what? When you break it down, somehow we all got to figure out how to love each other. 100%. Yeah. And build this new system because this new system incredibly it, it's profitable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In that heirloom system that you're talking about, the demand in the rest of the world, rest of the United States for cannabis of that kind of quality. That's what makes Hawaii unique is our geographical location. Our sun spectrum, I, I tell people this all the time. It's like, oh, what about the Hawaiian sun that makes it unique? I mean, if you look at common sense, you zoom out on the earth, there's way less atmosphere where Hawaii is and where the sun passes versus California. A sun at an angle will punch through way more atmosphere, giving a different spectrum. That's what makes Hawaii special. And that's what even allows our small little microclimates to happen in such s- short areas. You know, like, Fucking, like I said, you know, up Makakilo to Kapolei. Completely different vegetation growing in that places. Hawaii has unique cannabis because not only do we have the sun spectrum that causes this microclimates, but the microclimates that influence the soil that the plant's growing out of. So that right there makes Hawaii super valuable in the cannabis aspect because we have variety, diversity in such a small place. So... Why then, like, with all this diversity and all this fucking availability, I always wonder, like, why in Hawaii, bye guys, like, there is so much, like, hateration and, like, crabs in a bucket kind of mentality. It's money, bro. People want to cap out on everybody else. I think it's also because maybe there's this idea or... It's all that bad traits, narcissism, you know what I mean? Like, (laughs) people want to have that one up on the other person, like, fuck your shit, my shit's better. Why is that? No, yeah, but Purple. Why? Because <laughs> we're in this small little fishbowl of an island, mm-hmm. and everybody's fighting to make a name and get out. So the best way maybe a lot of people feel is just to fucking pull everybody else down. You know what I mean? There's a lot of that shit. But I see a lot more now of locals supporting local. There's like right, a resurgence right. of that. Like right. a lot was like, like you said, fuck this guy. I do it better. Right. Anytime you tell somebody, oh, I know one guy who play guitar, like, fuck my uncle. He can fucking jam. Like, you always want to. The one-upper, bro. Yeah. That's, that's narcissism right there. You There's know? a lot. There's a lot. And it comes to when it, it's the detrimental to business. It's detrimental to progress. Right. You know what I mean? And, if, like, people just realize there's all this diversity. You can pick your lane. And 100%. there's choke lanes. 100%. So let's fucking drive together. I blame the DOE. We could, let's vote on that. Okay. Do we <laughs> say that the common cause is, is our education system? True. Right? Mm-hmm. And and that's something that we need to be inspired to change. We've had, and let's just start at statehood, enough time to see what works and what doesn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And many of us are products of this educational system. And we see a lot of disparities in our community and how people were educated and how their life turned out. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I, I feel like, you know, unfortunately, many solutions going to require us to change our practices and come together it's kind of true it's, it's kind of going to be universal it's kind of you know it doesn't matter what it is or the solution is always going to come back to where do we stand personally and what are we willing to sacrifice right and those there's many that aren't hell no because cool. they're still stuck on their nine to five too you know they're 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 droned into this i mean don't get me wrong I'm kind of like an adopted believer where like I think there is a purpose to the machine, but I think there's also a purpose for farmers equally to the machine. You know, like we've come so reliant on that part of it that to break free right now, I think that people will be like a fucking ostrich. Their head in the fucking sand waiting for the next guy to do it for them. I was just about to say, Clay, this is the single greatest economic opportunity for Akamai people that see massive amounts of waste. Yeah. Yeah, and if you can convert that waste into a resource right now, because real soon, if you don't get on it, smart guys, this is this is naturally where it's at. 
Yeah, and this waste conversion and keeping nutrients on our island and making them available, this trend is never going to get old. Right. Right? The question is going to come down to where you get your milk from, where you get your bone from, because even those sources are going to be limited. The real question is where you get your sugar from. Yeah. So the smart person that's thinking bigger is thinking about how to create our own sugar cane industry again, because that's an important part of traditional land management and mm-hmm. biomass, right? This is something like from our ancestors. Yeah. The Koreans actually use sugar. We just use the whole damn plant. And yeah. it was an integral part into land management and soil production. Well, so come? is there no longer any <clears throat> sugar produced in Hawaii? I don't think so. I'll tell you this, how crazy it is right now. I think it's a dollar a foot. For local sugar cane right Get now. Get the fuck out of here. Yeah, that's what it is. dollar foot. Oh, you guys still got still got sugar cane? No, home? I just know that if when when we were growing it, if someone that was the standing wholesale offer was basically a dollar cool. a foot for organic sugar cane, just shucked, but just in its That was an atrocity that, that we got rid of sugar cane, not because of the sugar byproduct, but because of like there's so much uses in the soil for the sugar cane. And the facilities. I mean, we're already having massive production facilities for extraction and processing there was there's really no reason why we shouldn't be extracting and processing diverse crops and somehow mm-hmm. tooling those facilities up to 100 to yeah. yeah to process what we do have right right they just sit rusted as a yeah. fucking shocking they're just for sale why they are not imminent domained and t- i mean you know we really could go down a whole different political <laughs> route but but i mean the politicians have they have money in their budgets they have uh, mechanisms to take over land why they don't is is beyond us but but really should be imminent domain or just somehow use a mechanism to take it over and actually grow food for the people. I mean, you reduce health costs, right? increase Have, increase living. And what is like their public stance on what they're going to do with that land, all that old fucking sugarcane land on Maui? Oh. Have they like even like... Maui. They talk, do they talk about well, it? Or well, just it's, like, first of all, it's... it's all this land that A and B sold that maybe they didn't have title to sell, mm-hmm. but it's been mishandled enough times to make the heirs of that land really question how much they're willing to fight to win it back. Mm-hmm. Right. And so the new landowners is a is a corporation from Canada. Mm-hmm. It's like, isn't it mixed there? With yeah, I mean, they're mixed with A and B. And, and like, let's, you know, we've had the conversation. We might as well just throw it out there. I mean, whatever, whatever. I, I doubt anybody from listener base is going to have too much of a reaction is <laughs> from these groups. But look, Mali is so corrupt. The politicians are so corrupt. I mean, you know, they they touch everything about it. So the reality is, it's not about what's right. It's not about what's best. It's, it's not about justice. It's not about permits. It's not about whatever. It's literally, it's about actually politicians that a have the wherewithal, b care, mm-hmm. and, and and c have the gusto to actually like stand up for what's right and do their right. job. Right. And at the moment, collectively, they prefer to not do that. So what happens is permits, like for example, the water permit for yeah. this land had lapsed. That water permit had lapsed, and while there was a discussion going on about what should be happening with this permit, it just just renewed, just kind of like ha- had a thing, you know. And so, magic, the, the paperwork yeah. is here. What? Yeah, the, yeah. The, yeah. What the, so fuck? the protocols that everyone else has to follow are not fo- are not followed often. So that's just a real piece of doing business, right? So, so that 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 becomes the reality of that piece of Maui, which Mahi Pono is the current group. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, it's really strange, you guys, but the. The greater a force of accountability we are, the more freedoms that we have. Right. Yeah, and it's just like there's a huge amount of self-accountability that gives you courage to hold anything else accountable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and that's also like in our own communities, these are just challenges that we face. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I feel like our agricultural problem is systematic. Our food problem, mm-hmm. like there's so many different levels. Where do you start off from? Right. Right. Yeah. So it's like to expect people to make a swap from however they're farming to Korean natural farming, I think is a far stretch. Right. Mm-hmm. I think it's more like, hey, you're growing some flowers. You want to see if there's a difference in feeding your existing system some fermented plant juice. Mm-hmm. Right. You're going to do this just in the flowering stage. You're going to see if you can take your already what you believe to be your best and see if you can tweak that. Right. How much of that is a risk, right? And I think the more comfortability that people get in seeing what the results are, the more favorable mm-hmm. um, they'll want to participate. I mean, the reality is this. 
if you take Dr. Cho's method and you feed every single day the one to a thousand, without a doubt, you have the most absolutely ridiculous harvest you ever had in your entire life. You don't even need to swap out anything. Just feed it all from the beginning to the end because it's in such small amounts that the plant's really just going to pick and choose what it wants to eat. What I want to see is I want to see that in a agricultural cannabis situation with the current practices that they're using. <clears throat> 350 gallon res every hour on the hour feeding. Yep. They did they're doing rock wool cubes, you know, so there's no there's no soil, there's no so but I want to see some biodiversity in those rock wool cubes able to handle that environment of just exploded glass, right? Um I want those that new wave of farmers to participate in that that notion of you know sustainability and lower your fucking footprint keep that technique if that's a technique you guys want to grow in and you know every, there's a lot of sides to the fucking paintbrush you know what i mean like whatever you want to do the painting still is going to get done fucking if they were to adapt that and apply that in the same regiment that they're comfortable to and produce quality flowers that pass tests there's money to be had all around without fucking us up. So that strengthens the fucking cannabis movement in a, in a forward direction where it's like, bruh, here's your fucking license. We're never going to be compliant, man. We know you're doing a safe. There's no none of that shit. Man. I, I think of who might in the cannabis arena uh, in Hawaii, who kind of my heroes are. Mm -hmm. They're all guys that are all making their own newts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they, they all have living soils. Uh, not all of them are outdoors. A bunch of them are indoors, mm -hmm. right? They just have taken it to the next level. And I think that, to me, is what is going to separate, like, the, the average farmer from, from the guy that's really going to survive. Right. And, I, and I believe that it's going to be harder and harder for conventional farmers to be profitable in our industry. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like our demand is super high. But once the dispensaries figure out how to produce better medicine there could be i mean they're in line right now when we just look at the policies that are being created yeah yes but the roadblock is a, their method is what i just previously mentioned so to find a, a ground where that could be adapted into that method now you would find a lot of past tests now you'd find some terps some terpene results that might be a little bit closer to an outdoor, you know, a, a little bit more of a natural outcome. What is about to happen, I think, in policy wise, is I think it's going to change. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the, this is really comes down to the politicians and the lawmakers right. creating laws that are the most sustainable for them, mm -hmm. not for the people, the patients that are receiving it. Yeah. Right. And to have 36,000 medical cannabis patients, but such a small participation in the actual dispensaries. Right, shows how many people are actually farming and why they're farming is really about producing a higher quality of medicine for themselves. Right. And so the same conclusions that we're all, I mean, guarantee right now today, uh, guys, executives from these dispensaries are listening to this podcast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they are trying to figure out the Rubik's Cube of the local cannabis market and what excites people. And if you've seen what they're trying to do is they're trying to partner with other brands that are known, mm -hmm. right, to get a notoriety of, of having something special when we all know they actually don't. Yeah. Yeah. And it all boils down. I mean, basically, you're, you just, what you just told me was, hey, Uncle Daniel, I need you to take this cafeteria food and enter it in the James Beard Foundation because we put some strawberry goop on top of it right before we served it to the kids. I'm telling you, like, bro, we probably that mechanism. It's already being squeezed for the highest that they can squeeze out of it. Right. Yeah, and yes, we can add all kinds of flavors and help them in this, but the reality is they're complaining about the policy. And, you know, for cannabis, too, it, it goes a little bit further than that, like the horizontal integration, right? Let's say horizontally integrated um, on a special tiered system that we, we're all trying to fight for. Um, but taking farmers that have special practices and using the dispensaries as a retail front to, to showcase these fucking special farmers locally, you know, having a special seal on your product saying that this was Korean natural farm grown. Having a seal, you know, like it's like fucking. Tell me right now, Kalea, how many badges? listeners 
would not go to a dispensary tomorrow if you said, hey, by the way, tomorrow we're running not a special, but it's special because uh, Grow Guru and Aloha Organics produce boom, boom, boom. Right, people would go down. That's mm-hmm. what people want. That's the story. They don't want to hear yeah. about rich politicians right. growing mediocre cannabis, freaking trying to shove it down their throat, and it's pretty obvious when they don't buy it. Right, right. right. So you know how. Th- this is where the those Western practices are. While these guys, they they don't practice this lifestyle. Right. The guys that got the fire, that got the following. If. They don't do some radical changes and start to dream bigger and just push it. Look, let's just let's talk about the elephant in the room. Anybody been out to Kerwai Lua? I haven't. Yeah, but we just had Jay on last week. Mm-hmm. Oh, what do you think of Jay's operation? I have no idea what like their scale is there, and I've seen videos on Instagram. And it looks pretty massive. It's a um, <laughs> it's a it's a pretty it's really progressive. Um, the technology is there as far as the equipment and everything. Um, He's providing for a lot of patients. I have a question, though. Is it one of these things, like you were saying earlier, where, like, if the dispensaries and all these guys, if they copied your style, would that be cool? Like, you know, if they learned Dude, from you and here's started the thing. growing it that way? Is we, that, like, we win. Better? Right. We win. And this is, where, this is where people just don't dream big enough. Look, this is what happens. Every time somebody in the current state of our fertilizer production graduates and makes their own, they actually make room for us to supply the next guy. Right. Because we can only supply so much. You know, we're like a chef at a restaurant. You can only seat so many tables. When somebody leaves, then you got the next person. Yeah. And if you can go home and cook the same shit for your wife that I make you, and then she will be like, oh, my God, I love it even more than Daniel's. (laughs) Then, damn it, I tell you what, that's the shit I want you to eat. Stop coming to my restaurant already. Um, You know how to cook it. (laughs) And, And so, like... The market and the need is so gargantuan that by the time nobody wants to buy our product because everybody's making it, um, we'll have completed our life existence, yeah, and the education in Hawaii will be, we'll have done our part. I mean, this is what I I shared with you, Kalei. You know, I'm super hesitant to, um, like, I learned how to pick my battles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, natural agriculture, for me, has the longest vision of anything that I'm participating in. Right. Yeah. To see the barren land return to forest, to that ulu orchard in Kahana. I get to watch a ulu orchard of 300 trees using natural farming practices grow mm-hmm. forward. I get to participate in that shit and I get to see it. And in my lifetime, perhaps some of the scarring Mm -hmm. that has occurred in our community. Yeah, when I see people from every race planting trees together. Yeah, feeding the land together. It's like, it's kind of healing. Well, you you have that reassurance that it's going to be there for the next generation. So is the practices that come along with what you planted. You're, You're planting not only fucking physical trees, but you're planting manao right there of what you've done. That's the intention of our company. Right. That's how we've built it. Right. Believe it or not, we've had people try to come in and like buy shares, want to loan us money, all kind of like interesting things that, believe it or not, there's all kinds of ways to make sure that everybody is sustainable. Mm -hmm. But how we define profit has to be measured differently. Definitely. The impacts that we have in our community at some point need to equate to the amount of money that we value. Yeah. Like, right. you know, I, and I feel this way and it just might be selfish of me. Say, Oh, Daniel, you don't know. But I, I feel like having neighbors like Monsanto and Syngenta spraying chemicals in the air around schools, it is harmful to our kids in our community. And I feel like they're taking something away that's important to us, right. you know, and as somebody that goes fishing and sees the soil, I see, feel the impacts. Yeah. When I, when I take my kids to some of these places, like my heart real heavy. Cause I wonder like, you know, I'm over here trying to heal this. I know what if I'm simultaneously giving my kids cancer. Right. Right. 
Yeah, and people don't think of Hawaii in this format, but we have places here, you guys, that are on the EPA Superfund site for most toxic place ever because of agriculture chemicals that still to today are unchecked, unregulated, and just like Red Hill, just left for somebody else to clean up. I can fucking attest to that with my farm lot in Cunia. Like, Monsanto is literally fucking 100 feet from my farm lot. So as I'm looking through the dirt, when I finally get there and I finally <coughs> cut all the grass and do all my shit, I'm looking at the dirt like, fuck. This was like straight moon dirt. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's been through some shit. So IMO applications on the regular for the first year that I've been there. Is like, that, I mean, that's something that you can do. You can take that old ag land that's been monocropped for decades. Well, and now like I'm starting to see earthworms in places where there weren't any. Eric, anything. we have to. So do you till that shit or do you just no, like no till no till no, no till yeah. mix? You're just layering and layering. But like say like your farm like you clear the the grass and now there's dirt and it's dead dirt. What are you doing? Are you just spraying shit on the dirt to like make it grow? You're or? putting biology that's gonna help the surrounding vegetation mm-hmm. get and, and colonize that area. So like grass, right? Right. You have a fucking bald spot. You cut out, especially if you have a fungal infestation in that grass. For people that have like you know lawns, mm. big old brown spot. Usually that's a fungal fungus that's attacking that the base of the grass. So you remove that that spot that's infected. You get your IMOs. You spray it on that spot. So you're re-inoculating and you're you're putting population there to compete with that pathogenic population that was existing mm-hmm. to push it away. So when you replant. It's fresh, new beneficials for like antibodies and shit. It's a flu shot. Or the doggy. microorganisms. And I mean, yeah. I'd like to point out, I mean, I think at its essence, you asked earlier, and I've been kind of thinking about it, like a, an easy way to describe K&F and, and Jadam. I mean, I think they're, they're, they're similar in this way is that we're really just trying to copy the rainforest. You know, we were having this discussion earlier. Right. The most fertile places in the world, in, in Hawaii, in South America, I mean, th- these are places they don't, they don't do any compost tilling. Mm-hmm. They're not... They're not measuring, nope. you know, temperatures. They're not doing anaerobic versus aerobic, right. having arguments about sugar or not, or buckets or not, right? right which right. which we've had right, quite right, a few right. of discussions around. Yeah. But the reality of it is they're putting down plant waste. They're putting down water. They're, they're mixing in air. And they're doing that over and over and over again. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. those are becoming the most fertile areas. They're not clearing out space, making sure there's 20 feet between each tree so the canopy does. Right. None of this is happening. Well, right? that's us firing. being human, right. right? Us being human, are, it's trying to measure and quantify what nature's doing in, in, a, in a manner which, you know, data. That's how we interpret what nature's doing in data. Yeah. But like, you know, with, with the Amazon, they have, uh, I think it was the Red Sea where it dries out and all the krill dies. That krill gets airborne, flies to the Amazon, and supplements the soil with the right percentage of soil that's been or phosphorus that's been um, depleted during that season. So it's we gotta f- fucking remember that the Earth is an entity, a self-regulating entity, where man can't quantify or measure what the Earth is doing on a regular basis. So all we can do is understand what we can measure. Everything outside of that. Hands down. <clears throat> and, and, and anything we're doing that's actually interfering with natural rhythms is, is clearly has systemic and lasting problems. Mm-hmm. Butterfly effect, man. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Easily. But there is something that, like, you know, the rainforest is doing. Yeah, it's, it's being self-sustainable and keeping its you know, life alive. But what I'm trying to say is there is an outside influence that has to occur for it to be as bountiful as it is. You know, like that whole krill being airborne, the phosphorus depletion, all of that shit. So there is a sort of sense where we, we can't understand that dynamic in any, what we can is what we can measure, right? Assist, right? So like that Amazon shit. Have you seen that with like LIDAR technology? They've been finding like way more structures and evidence of like s- cities and shit deep within the rainforest. Uh, actually, like, have like just human been- yeah, like human, like like Mayan and Aztec or all that kind of shit, or that are just gone now because a hundred years after these people died off, fucking the rainforest swallowed that shit back up, and it looks just like trees in the forest, and you wouldn't even know it. But with this new technology, they can see like through the trees and shit with just planes. I feel like I need that for my yard. Structures and shit, dude, it's crazy. I wonder Lidar. what's up with the Mima Mounds in Washington. You ever heard of that? And they yeah, all yeah. All over the United States. I wonder, like if that's the case that happened underneath it, or if it's like just a wind pattern that came due to loss of vegetation and made those little berms in the, in the soil. You know, it's crazy. You Could never fucking flood. know. 
and, and I and I think to the point of what what Kalei is trying to do with his soil. I mean, what we're what whether it's AO or, or it's KNF or it's Shadam or any other method of mm-hmm. of just putting reusing your waste, turning it into a microorganism rich substrate and putting that on your ground. I mean, that's the goal is just increasing diversity and increasing density, and those are the principles of KNF as well as just the principles of healthy soil dynamics and Thank and, you. and growing. I love that. It's it, like closing a loop, right? Because it all just kind of circles back into right, itself. And, right. and there's many ways to skin a fucking cat. You hear that, right? Ouch. Right. They're all, it doesn't matter. They're all the same. Right. Yeah, for this. But like, but having the water solubleness, it, it hits, especially cannabis industry, it hits a demographic in which that demographic is the ones that are heavy into the synthetic aspect of the growth. Yeah, we're hitting. We're, I mean, we're hitting hydroponics. I mean, that's our that's our big. We're so hitting, hitting different one of our good friends, right, whose name we shall not mention. Um, <laughs> I like these kind. Uh, <laughs> brews a lot of teas yeah. in his ag practices. Yes. Yeah, and what he found is that his microbes liked the additional inputs 100%. from the KNF. Right. right. So he took his existing practice and he just started integrating these other things. Mm-hmm. And because he knew what the outcome that he wanted, right. he was able to see what worked and what didn't work. It's an observational data collection, right? Sharpen so, your sword with every science. technique. Everybody's right. a fucking scientist. Right. Unfortunately, I don't want to say our friend who shall not be mentioned, didn't continue his practice on the same scale that he was doing it. Mm -hmm. And so really his research in this direction sort of ended. Right. But I will say this on a strange note. He is currently at home farming vegetables using all the KNF practices and all of his extra soil. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Because he had extra nutrients from us and he doesn't want to brew teas. So I think what I want to remind folks is like how all this agricultural stuff got invented was somebody invented this shit, right? right? They paid attention. They mimic something. All of these deep philosophies, whether Western or Eastern, or indigenous or from aliens. It's common right? denominator, man. It all makes sense to go and experiment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and to keep sharpening your agricultural practice if, if you challenge yourself as a farmer. Yeah. You're always trying to take it just a little bit. I don't think prior to our product being available on the market that there was something regularly available. Yeah, no. I've seen KNF inputs available here and there. But what I believe is that our consistency, over a short amount of time, what I've seen is this. The guys that use it, their orders increase. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the guys that are already using it and making it, when they slip up and don't have enough OHN or for whatever reason they fall short, mm-hmm. the other one that is the most funny, don't laugh, is they actually use our product as a gift for someone that they want to get interested into natural farming. That's awesome. Because their shit has a label on it. It looks real pretty. Right. It's easy to measure. Right. right? It has all of these principles that make it like – it's just kind of stuff that we, we like argued about, like making sure that you could measure it. And I was like, no, this is important. And they were like, yes, it's important. But where the hell do I find a bottle like this? And holy shit, we got to buy 5,000 plastic bottles. You're killing the planet. Here's the reality. It's like in order to get people to make that change, you have to give them those opportunities. Right. Right. You have a three-ounce opportunity to change your relationship with agriculture. That's what I look at every bottle. Killer. And that 23 gallons of solution that it will make was a solution for our family that we put into practice to the point that we feel strongly that you might want to try it. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, and when people see the consistency of what our family has been working on, I don't think you can deny it. Mm-hmm. I literally would have people collect, come to my farm five years ago mm-hmm. and be like, Daniel, you're not a farmer. What are you growing? You know, actually, I had a whole bunch of ava. I lost 400 ava plants because I made them all from the same cutting tree, and they got a disease, and then everything freaking died. And, like, I was having I was root nematodes, all kinds of problems with my soil. Like, I'm just dealing with, like, real-world crisis of having no <laughs> topsoil. Right. Yeah, and just realizing, like, either I can battle and try to, like, miracle grow this, 
or like I just got to change my mentality and just super huge invest biomass yeah. nutrients just yeah. feed it beyond all when i thought i couldn't feed it anymore i dug a hole buried a horse right mm -hmm. like and just to be fair you guys it didn't harm any horses somebody's oh, just horse. straight out somebody's horse died and then they took it to the dump and then at the dump which is where you can take an animal to toss it where they were going to take it the lady loved this horse so much Okay, it broke down crying, and the guy at the dump knew me, called me up, and said, Daniel, you won't even believe this. This horse is like her child. Oh, shit. And I dug a hole at my place, and we buried her child and just feeding my family nutrients. You know what I'm saying? And I don't sound like in a real crazy way, but, like, this is actually another way that we complete the cycle. This is how we feed the Aina. This is why our ancestors were buried in the land, yeah? Yeah. They were there to feed our future generations and sustain us. And this might seem like really strange philosophies, but this is like what all of our people were doing before we started killing the damn planet Yep. for profit. Yep. And for the first time, there's an opportunity. And I will use Brian's word. We're not for profit. So our organization is already owned by everybody. Right. right. But there is opportunity. You guys are recording this, right? Yeah. <laughs> right now <laughs> evidence there, there there's opportunity right now for other people to make a profit mm -hmm. doing natural farming whether it's education providing their own nutrients right i want that people to look at aloha organic as a model to copy right yeah we've got we've got good uh packaging all right guys guess what you need good packaging you need good labeling good directions how to take your product and use it we have those old ladies can use our product. Right. Yeah. You don't need to have. I mean, you need to be able to read in English, um, but it's simple right. English. Yeah. Right. Um, and and we're working on getting it translated into other languages because we believe that this product is like places in the world don't have access to fruits and vegetables fresh. Mm. So everything that they would make with nutrients in those things would be stuff from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Right. What if, Kale, your whole business was growing something to ferment it, to send it to Norway as a nutrient to help feed their land so that they're not using chemicals? Yeah, totally. Right? Because Syngenta, they're from Switzerland. Right. You look at all of these companies. They're all European companies that had to create these things mm -hmm. to grow in a short window. Right. Right. I mean, global crisis, you know, saving fucking world hunger could be, you know, think about like. Hey, dream big, guys. Aloha Organic ends the war in Ukraine. Okay. All right. <laughs> think about like the places where like there's droughts, you know, and establishing a good microbial body there that will help retain moisture in the soil. Transforming those uninhabitable places to places that could be. I mean, fuck, dude, Western technology, I'm sure we can fucking find a way to irrigate water and such to where we need to get what we get. I mean, what about global conversion of pig and cattle to deep litter systems? Yeah. Ending sumps across the world. Yeah. Like, that shit is actually possible in our lifetime. You know, this whole commercial farming thing, it's all scalable. The other day, I was hanging out at a 150 by 50 deep litter pen on Maui. With like three to four hundred pigs in it, happy pigs, and I was looking at these pigs and trying to figure out if they were really happy because they seemed to be hanging out on one side of the pen particularly, so they were like kind of close together, but only on one half. The other half was kind of empty. Right. Yeah, and so then they walked us onto the outside, and then I realized how happy the pigs were because there was actually a ramp for the pigs to come outside. Oh, they wanted to stay inside. They were cruising inside. Right, there's like less than 20 pigs on the outside. No shit. All of them were hanging out on the inside. And someone actually made a comment in our group, like, dude, these are some really content pigs. And I thought they were caged, so I just thought that, you know what I'm saying? That, like, yeah, but they're caged. And when I went outside, I realized oh, there was a ramp for them dog. to come out. I yep. was like... They got an option. Oh, I got privately silenced and <laughs> even even amazed again. And thinking, like, how big of a solution is this? Just imagine our entire pork industry and cattle industry, as far as penned animals, live on wood chips and logs. 
Right. All right. That are then turned into healthy, freaking probiotic rich systems that are feeding our agriculture system. Right. Does this not sound like what people have been doing for countless generations already? Right, but right. now there is a science to back it up. Yeah. You got to thank the Koreans. Right. This guy went out, sacrificed his life. What he saw was the future of chemical agriculture in Korea based upon his knowledge of the world. Mm. Yeah. And he realized on his math that if he didn't compartmentalize and put into writings and do the research for their agricultural practices in the conversion to chem ag, they would not only lose their practices, but they would also at some point deplete all their soils and not have their own solutions to back their way out of it. They're shooting themselves in the foot by using that fucking method, right? So I when mean, did KNF like become a thing? Like when did this guy? The food source, right? Brad, this is sparse. like 60s, Brad. This yeah. is like not it... even in Asia. Yeah. Right? And then it came and into of... Hawaii about 25 years ago, 30 years ago. <laughs> but like all of Korea follows this model, or is it just like kind of like some organic farmers follow this thing? Like kind of here, some do KNF. It was some... because there's a famine because of the war and shit, right? Is that, is that what started the it? Class is part of it. And, and there is a province that is um, 100% organic that, that these guys, some of them are from, that, that actually, like, shockingly, from what I understand, I mean, again, possible translation mix-ups but is 100 percent organic everything so all of the restaurants you go to everything allowed to be grown in the region is fully organic grown wow yeah fuck some kung fu agriculture shit you know what i'm saying like you show up to like box and the guy starts doing some freaking kicks and shit like whoa you ever seen seabreeze farms in seattle or right outside seattle so they're they're a self-sustainable farm all the way through fucking five-star chef fucking can manipulate flavors textures based off of what he can forage around his lot mm. wonderful uh, bro like yeah. cow placenta he uses that and he cooks that you know um he finds different flowers and herbs that would mimic garlic and he can do that as like a, a a garnish that would give a fucking garlicky taste so he doesn't have to go and over farm garlic you know what i mean so he changes the way he cooks to be more sustainable beautiful clay on that note yeah, this is something I learned from growing taro that is applied to cannabis in my life. Yeah. Because I cook so much taro, I started smelling these different smells in taro. Mm-hmm. And you know, everybody tells you they're organic. Yeah. Um, but one day I actually happened to be on a trip and um, the particular farmer that I was with who told me they were 100% organic happened to be just have picked up their fertilizer order on their way to picking me up from the airport. Ah, let me see and a tarp, then, bro. Move that so, tarp. No, the best part was I rode in the back of the truck right next to right it, next. and it was, like, right in my face. And this is way before any KNF really, like, entered or inspired my life. But what happened was I, I took some of that, and I, and I was smelling it for some reason. And I realized that that was the smell I was smelling when I was cooking my taro. Mm. And so what I actually started to do is I started to take different chemicals, and I would literally smell these agrochemicals and smell my food. And through that, I was able to find farmers that were true and honest, that their Mm. food spoke to their practices. Mm -hmm. And I think with cannabis, it's super important. Like, I don't want to stress how many times growing up like now i'm spoiled that i'm in a network of people that have genuine medicine that use these practices and support each other um but prior to that man cannabis is all over the place yep in flavor texture function and if you're really looking at a medicine and having consistencies you know when i think of when i want to smell my medicine what do i want it to smell like right Mm -hmm. and that goes down to genetic diversity too right um, there's so much breeding going on with cannabis that you're going to get shit all over. But it, we got to find like, okay, for your, your ailment, the cannabinoid, flavonoid, and terpene mixture in the entourage effect, that would best benefit your particular ailment. So it, now because our fucking breeding has just, boom, exploded, it's more of a hunt on where my genetics came from and where I can bottleneck it to find the medicine that's out currently that I would consume. You know what I mean? So it's one part grow, 
because we want to be safe and responsible about the medicine we produce. That it's clean. It's gonna fucking kill nobody. You know, no allergic reactions. Dried, cured properly. Tastes good. But you're gonna have that extra like this is tailor made for you, Daniel, because you have sore back. This gets rid of all anti-inflammatory properties and it has the terpenes that give you relief and allows you to sleep. You know. And that, friends, was geeky. Hey, okay. woo-hoo, geeky. That's just not just regular knowledge. Just breaking it down. And wouldn't it be amazing, right? You think of it, like you are gathering the lao to make your ferments to mm-hmm. feed your medicine. Mm-hmm. So the lao kahi, the olena, the very things that you know would heal your body. You're Contribute. applying them to yourself through what you feed your food and your medicine. Yep. I'd also like to add and point out, I mean, we, we happen to know that our mindset affects physical reality, right? We're, we're, we're aware quantum physics, quantum mechanics essentially tells us this. Yeah. So we know that if, if we take that into our plants and we take that into our production levels, that our, our outputs are going to carry that, that vibration and energy. So along with, I think the things you mentioned, you know, yep. something that's people that go organic clearly have just, I mean, we're not going to say higher, lower, left, right vibration, but just a, a more in service vibration which is yeah. one that you can trust is going to be aligned 100%. with an altruistic goal. And if you take a look at the, the organic practices and just being an organic farmer, you need to be a meticulous motherfucker. You need, to, you need to know where things go and what's its purpose, what's its function. Not only that, more responsible farmer is, where did I get my fucking nutrients? What's its function? And when does it go in? So all of this applied, this is just a reflection of your farmer. That's why we call them craft farmers. You know what I mean? They know the purpose and function of everything they're throwing into the soil. They know when to predict the outcome and what their product is as a result of that care. So that's a true definition of craft farmer. Calais cannabis will be the very first industry that they're doing that on a massive scale. 100%. Exactly what you're talking about. Everybody's trying to figure out what that solution is. And the moment that that one can be branded and be true it will produce phenomenal quality medicine. Mm-hmm. And I disagree. Game over. I disagree that there no. is an entity that can adhere to the plant in, at such a means. Well, I mean, I'm you, saying that's the goal. That, that's, that's the, the goal. goal. And the, I, don't, right. I agree with you. I don't think anyone's going to get there uh, anytime perfect. soon. But they are pursuing that. Yes. Yeah. But I think the goal should be many micro farmers with craft touch allows diversity in product, right? So, yeah, but just imagine that lower Eva sugar plane. Yeah, and when you had, if you was <sighs> growing whatever the Eva fire was, it 40,000 acres who fucking wouldn't want just that from that zone, you I know, mean, like. I talk about gardening <sighs> naked, you know what I mean? Fuck, that space, guaranteed. Guaranteed, guaranteed right? Bro. I think of district like Ka'u, yeah. best coffee. Yeah. What grows well with coffee? How big is Ka'u? Mm-hmm. Size of Oahu. You can put the entire island of Oahu in Kau. Here's a singular microclimate that has so much ag potential, 100%. right? Big Island get that all over. You could you could just pick swats in just different elevations and have you know. I think um, infrastructure influences that. So and it, government subsidy and government I mean, subsidy that, that really needs to increase. Yeah, we got to mention the, the, the fucking the minor, elephant in the room. Yeah, the minor fraction, the minor fraction of a budget that that is right. is is. is shocking right. and really that's that's sh- that's something that should that if yeah. it did shift would solve that problem how, yeah how are you gonna get a farm off the ground and you got no government subsidies especially how much acres you know what i mean this is where i also think you guys that cannabis farmers that are providing services in the community have a responsibility to figure out how they're giving back especially to agriculture yep yeah that just me mindset it, it trickles down in so many different ways and, and as a farmer, you know, it's real interesting. Farmers have said, well, how can I give back besides money, Daniel? He said, brah, donate medicine, right? And it's not just you have no idea who in your community, like Sista. a donation from Sista to some certain groups of kupunas would be an amazing ho'okupu, mm-hmm. right? It's like, do we go buy that box of chocolate for Auntie? Do we go buy that fake lay? Mm-hmm. How do we access, you know, some super crips mm-hmm. and, and involve that in how we grow and, and share this? Yeah, because 
I don't know, you guys, we're in a place. If we don't really start to come together as growers and start to support the community, that's what's going to create the environment for all of our fears to happen. But, you know, there's a lot of influence of westernized mentality of trapping, making that money, hustle, hustle, hustle. That, that economic mentality needs to get the fuck out. You know, we need to be a little bit more worried about our responsibility and taking care of what we need to. There's money to be made. But doing it in a way where you're giving back at the same time is the that should be the ultimate goal of everybody, especially if you're coming to the islands. You know what I mean? I mean, I, th- I think that's actually a labor unions or like or origin mentality, which right. I think actually could could benefit. I mean, I realize it's a far out thought, but I mean, the, the, the thought of cannabis farmers actually creating a union, holding down a price and just going, look, units are this like organic units from here are this. They go to the depot here. You get prepaid for your action then. And this is the distribution depot, and the units are that. If you're a buyer, you go to the depot. Hundred percent, right? And then everything is, is sorted, right? Everybody's, you know, your test results tell you what tier of pricing you fall under. Done, and guys. That's, that's the dream bigger mentality that I'm talking about. Yeah. Right. Say so we're like, how do we fit in this stupid box that all know. these dummies made? It's like, bro, let's break the box and rebuild four it. Four guys smoking like fucking joints to figure this out, and, right? And, like, and you know what? We can build. You can build in a subsidy insurance for the micro growers who have an issue with their crop. 100%. It's like, look, where you can see, we can, uh, on the whole, you can insure everybody because on the whole, the distribution center is going to be filled. I mean, here's the reality. For all the people that don't have jobs, yeah, for anyone that's ever dreamed about just sitting down for their job trimming, like these are like serious industries that will open up mm-hmm. just for local people that doesn't require you to run fast or lift a lot. Doesn't require computer sciences. It requires kind of like consistency. And trust me, if you're a trimmer, you are fucking appreciated, man. Appreciated. Yeah, yeah. Right. And this yeah. Is Nobody on, wants to do that. This is no. on the level. This is on the level that we're currently at to really scale up. Yeah. There's gonna be fucking trim schools. Right. Yeah. It's gonna be like an extra credit class you can take in like ninth grade that immediately puts you. In a kupuna trimming freaking class, and then you just don't get paid to trim until you turn 18 when you can legally work for these guys because you have to be, you know, have experience to get this job that pays this ridiculous amount because you're providing a real service in our community. I mean, these are things that like trade schools, they have auto, the auto mechanics, they got fucking farming, you know what I mean? What was it? ALC? ALC, ALC. Was usually, ALC yeah. was usually the, the farming class, right? We would be TLC, Trimmer's Last Chance. Right? No. Oh, you went with that ALC. Oh, right, you fuck oh. <laughs> but you know what's crazy? Like you guys all knew what <laughs> I was meaning. <laughs> but when I watch those guys now, I'm like, who's learning what? Like that's the fucking real lesson that they're learning. Like sitting in class, staring at the fucking ceiling, waiting for the bell to ring. These kids are working in the garden and they're understanding what the fuck's going on. But in that sense, it's like a punishment. Punishment. But if you look at, like, some of the ways charter schools, especially, like, Hawaiian charter schools are formatting their curriculum and their learning environment. Right. Project-based shit. You know what I mean? Teaching them about fucking... It really works. Yeah. Right. it does. Right. So much practical knowledge can come from... But, like, it also feels like nobody really wants to recognize and look at these places as a positive example of what could be accomplished. These, if you they, did that, then you would be saying that the DOE sucks. Yeah. And so if like you're employed by the DOE, you get basically kind of a decent sometimes job. If you've been there a long time, you're making a hundred grand a year as a teacher at the DOE, right? Uh, and then you have like all kinds of paperwork that protect you from like getting fired and all kinds of other things. Hit it on the nose, right? dog. It's like healthcare, medical, all these different things. And it's like you're doing pretty good. The drawback is you hate your job. I I worked for the DOE. So, like, I was a custodian. Mm. Fucking, I thought I sold myself myself short as a person because I was a drone every fucking day. Empty the rubbish cans, clean the trash, shine the windows. You know what I mean? It was a paycheck. I had a retirement, all this other shit. But... As a human being, was I at my full fucking potential? Probably not. And it's that, that department education mentality, it's state mentality, whereas, you know, you're going to fucking work, you're going to do your job, and that's it. There's no initiative. There's nothing else where you think outside the box. You know, I, I see that even in the school system when the kids are sitting down, like, 
who the fuck is going to sit at a desk eight, hour, eight hours a day and, <laughs> and totally fucking retain every information and then go home and do homework for seven or six classes, you know, and expect to be on the ball the next morning to learn it all again. I tell you what, though, the kids that could, you just separated them from the rest and then you appointed those as your, your worker managers, oh, right? And it's a great way to segregate people by their obedient skills, Oh yeah, right? And all the people that are super obedient, they could do that, that like killed themselves, stressed themselves, had all kinds of disorders, mm-hmm. suicidal because they were trying to like be valedictorian or all kinds of stupid things. You know what I'm Unnecessary most, pressure. Instagram memes, little stories was about this guy that is like super bad in school, failing, takes his freaking SAT score, gets like a 1400 on his SAT score, spends the rest of 11th grade just shaping up, senior kills it, goes to freaking college, murders it, starts a career just killing it, and then 12 years later gets a letter and says that he was a part of a group of 15 kids that got the wrong SAT test score. Whoa. That his real score was like a 620, okay? <laughs> But it's like somehow he was validated by this system that made him feel special and made that feel his performance yeah. increased right. just based on that. And it's like how many of us in the educational system are judged on that? Right. And, yeah. you know, it, it might be a, f- a far letter. cry, but I don't know anybody that has like five kids in the DOE system and all the kids are struggling as human beings feels like they invested well with their children's time growing up. 100%. Uh, a lot of my friends that went to college and they finished their college, they went, you know, post-college, still paying off their debt. They're still working. They're working to pay off their fucking debt. You know, it's like, at what point in time is this an investment or is this an investment into entrapment? Else? Entrapment. Never. There you go. That's yep. a better word. Entrapment. Never an investment. And You're a good goal for now. Right. So, and homie's still paying his fucking. His but he doctorates. came from Harvard. But you know what? You know? Got the college pepper. debt. College loan debt is one of the only debts you cannot fucking ever get out of. I know. Ever, 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 ever. It's a Unless you don't go to college. Word. Yeah. Or it's government subsidized. <laughs> or you oh, get yeah. a grant. Get FAFSA. Grants. What? Grants. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's cool. Grants are cool. One of the, my jiu-jitsu but, instructors was telling me, he's like, Kale, this day and age, to go to college, you really got to think it through. You know, to find out if it's something that we can't offer you here, that you have to go away to obtain the skills to further your dream. Anything short of that, Find something you love that's not going to put you in debt. And I was like, I mean, the fucking father figure of the year for me. You know what I mean? Like, this dude fucking gives me mad advice. And that advice, dude, I'm going to relay that to my kid. Like, girl, you don't have to. You don't have to. Like, Yeah, making that decision, I think, is powerful. Yeah. It was drilled into me that college was the path. Career, you know, good job, yeah. steady this. You don't bring home a fucking 3.8, you're a fucking nah. asshole. Well, you know I was I mean? an asshole then because I never did that. But yeah. I was always I, grounded. I was like, never, There's a 3.2. I was never grad. good at school, but I went through that process, right? But I wasn't the kid who stressed about grades. I was like, I'm cool with being a C <laughs> yeah, student. Yeah, right? You know what I mean? I'm passing. Yeah, I did I my best. My mom said, do your best. Yeah, That's yeah, what yeah. counts. You go home, your parents say, why you get a C? Well, mom, I, I did just exactly like yeah. you said. I did my best. Yeah. yeah. You like, still love me, yeah? You know, you could do better, but I mean, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I just kind of like middle passed it all the way through, you know what I mean? And then I got the good career that. and started off at the bottom and thought I followed the right steps all the way up and worked my way up through this corporate ladder and shit. Think of what you learned, though. 14 years later, I was like, fuck this shit. <laughs> but think of what you learned Left. all the way up, man. Like, that, even that journey of the corporate ladder stride wasn't for vain no. yeah, it's divine no, motivation you know what i'm saying yeah. you think back you have 14 years of great examples why well, changed mm. Fuck, it yeah. was a path to get me to where i am right now being right. able to do this you know what i'm saying right and there needs people like i mean we need people like you and you who are like carving that path and showing that you know what i mean there are other options where were you guys at career day in school it was always like fucking my dad's a lawyer, this and this. It was like, where were like the farmers coming? Like, maybe that's more so now. My dad was a rubbish then. man, so he taught me like how to reuse shit pretty often. Like, all my Nintendo games was found in the rubbish. I blow on them. 
do the little code for make it that works. fucker work. It works. It works. Right? Yes. I'm a blessed kid now. I don't care my Honestly, dad Honestly, I'd spend. be jealous of you growing up. And he, dad, he got a Nintendo. Right. I, I, I shit you not. I grew up without a TV. I play guitar, right? So, like, my dad brought me home an amp. I was like, oh, fuck yeah, my electric guitar. I could probably do, like, you know, metal shit. Oh, fuck. It was shocking me every time I touched the strings. <coughs> so, it taught me a little bit of electricity, right? Open me. up the fucking amp. I see the ground, ground wire fucking a little solder. Now I can jam. So, like, that adversity will teach you to be a fucking better person later on in life, you know? So, I like yeah. that, you know? Fair yeah. The bread is still good, man. The well, bread, we've been bread still is good. still good. <laughs> we've been going for, like, almost three hours or over three hours. Anu gave me a, a signal. So, let's okay. fucking wrap it up. All right, and cool, guys. Call, um, so, again, shout out your guys' Instagrams or where people can find you, how they can get in contact if they want to learn more, all that stuff. Uh, the artwork one is at Aloha Organic Org. Yeah, don't call me. Um, <laughs> um, no, no, uh, at Mana Eye. I'm currently um, looking for folks that are interested in participating in farm school. Um, if you are uh, homeless, uh, you might be pre-qualified. We're interested to focus on at-risk youth that Killer. possibly come from communities that are hungry, that want to learn more about subsistence. Uh, I think that's the roots of our organizational goal. You can go to ainamomona.org mm -hmm. uh, to take a look at more work that we do. That's what I'm talking about. Shit. Killer. Giving back, man. Right. Um, Oahu Garden Supply, 94150, Leo Leo Street, Wapahu, Hawaii, 96797, man. I'm there every Thursdays. Come check me out. You got any questions, feel free. I'm down to answer whatever. Come talk story. Yeah, I'm in beautiful Waipahu. And follow me on Instagram, Voices from the Planet. And subscribe to my other podcast. Um, thank you, uncles, for joining us. Thank you guys <laughs> so much. Yeah, thank you guys for having us. Right on. Right on, guys. Wake up, Mike.